to those of you <clears throat> for making it through the long awaited process and going through the Senate. I know that took many more months than any, any of us hoped, but we are really glad that you held on there and that you're here now. So welcome. Our agenda today, just quickly go through that. Um, do our normal, we have to approve our minutes. We'll talk about our retreat. We usually have one retreat a year. Um, it hasn't been in person since before COVID, but I think our, we're aiming for in person. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about that a little bit. We're gonna talk about some of the nuts and bolts of the commission since we do have our new members on today. Um, and then we do wanna touch back. We have some report outs um, from the foster care ombudsman, which Darren is here. Thank you for coming. Always have our child welfare update, a governor's office update. And then we really need to circle back on this educational outcomes for foster youth and talk about our next steps in that area. So any questions about the agenda? Anything we're missing? You're like, why aren't we bringing this? All righty. So I think I pass the torch over to Ellen. Okay. We, are, uh, we always do an icebreaker with our meetings. And um, so this one doesn't have to be long, but basically we will just have everybody introduce themselves. We'll go around and do like a popcorn style call on the next person, your name, your current job or role or what you do. And um, if you're a commissioner, then um, if you could say, what, it, what is your passion for this commission and this work? And if you're not a commissioner, just to say, what is your passion for this work? Um, just so we kind of get an idea of why, uh, why we're all here and why we all care about this so deeply. Um, and um, I'll go, I'll go uh, last since I usually go first, but I'm going to pop it over to Casey to start and kick us off because he's a commissioner and been here for a few years. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Casey Greer. I have been on the commission. I think this is my third year. Uh, I'm also a dependency attorney, and so uh, I represent kids in foster care, parents in foster care, and uh, I'm passionate about it because I was also, you know, a foster care youth. Um, really, I come into this work probably a little bit more focused well, largely focused on child-centered outcomes. And so, you know, while I always want to see the parents do the best they can, ultimately, like in my job and what I do is, you know, I want to see, and I talk about this a lot, I want to see kids successful out of foster care. So not coming back as parents themselves and whatnot. And, uh, you know, just want to share real quick that this last week was one of my toughest weeks on the job because the very first kid I ever got um, was found dead last week from an overdose in fentanyl. Um, and he had only been out of the system for a couple of months. He was only 18. So, you know, it's just another oh, example of where we can continue to improve, I think. And I will popcorn Jessica. Hello, good morning. My name is Jessica Hawash. Um, and to actually jump on that. So my passion, I'm a woman in recovery who is also a foster youth that kind of followed the path of my parents. And so for me, my passion really is um, I'm a CADC at this point in my life. Um, I've owned sober living homes and job training programs for people coming out of rehab and uh, prisons. And so that's really my passion is whole family healing. Um, most addicts are multi-generational and we see that. And so it has to start like as far back as we can go. And um, so I'm passionate about bringing that kind of viewpoint um, of lived experience and um, just treatment in general um, to the board, so. Oh, and I guess I need to assign the next person. So I'm gonna assign the next person I can see, which is Alicia Richard. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see new faces. Um, my name is Alicia Richard. Um, I've been on this commission for, has it been three years? I mean, Casey, I feel like you were here way before me, maybe two and a half years, two years. I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm the secretary as well. Um, let me see. I'm a person in long-term recovery as well. And I was a foster, former foster youth. And I also am a consumer of DHS child welfare with my own children. 
So I just, I don't know. I feel like all around this commission is just super important and dear to my heart because I'm like Casey says, like I'm all about um, stopping the cycle of addiction um, and preventing kids, you know, parents from having their kids go into care too. So I think this all like aligns together. Um, and I'm all about like system change and providing parent voice. Um, lived experience is super important to me. So that's why I'm here. And um, is that all I'm supposed to say? Okay. All right. Seema, welcome. Hi, everyone. Morning. Um, I'm Seema. I'm brand new, so no months to it. Um, so I am um, the founder of Oregon's Project Never Again, a nonprofit that supports kids in uh, Oregon's foster care. Um, and we're gradually moving on a national platform, but that's slow in making. Um, I am also a former CASA and a former foster youth myself. So um, my uh, passion, I would say, is to learn as much as I can and um, bring to the table my learned experiences and how we can bring congruency in terms of our existing policies or what needs to come about and uh, actually what happens in foster care you know um, i honestly feel um it, it's just a, such a complex um platform so i'm excited to be on this team to learn from each of you um so help me along the way and let's see who can i popcorn oh this sounds fun uh darren Good morning, everyone. I'm Darren Mancuso, uh, foster care ombudsman with the Governor's Advocacy Office. Um, all approaching 10 years in this position in just about two weeks, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about my annual report, the 2023 annual report. So we'll go through that, all the fun metrics and data for all those folks that love that stuff. Uh, my passion is is advocating for um, those that really can't advocate for themselves and being the voice of of children in foster care and and helping them navigate this complex system and, as well as as resource parents. Um, as you'll see in my report, we go through that. We'll go through who's reaching out to me and calling. and um, yeah, just happy to do that. and uh, well, as some of you may have heard, I am retiring in a couple months. Uh, we have interviews at the end of the week. So hopefully the next meeting, maybe there'll be somebody sitting alongside me that can uh, that will be in this position as well. So appreciate it. I will popcorn it over to Kim. Thanks, Darren. Hi, everyone. Kim Keller, she, her pronouns. I'm the child permanency manager. Um, and when when I sitting here thinking about my passion, um, I've had so many thoughts going through my head. It's hard to kind of pinpoint one, but I've been with uh, the agency since 1994. And when I started, I I specifically remember, I mean, vividly in my head, um, a certifier telling me back then uh, that the apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree in reference to uh, looking at relati relatives and certifying relatives. And, you know, that was our agency's philosophy back then. And um, really unfortunate. And I am thrilled that we have changed our philosophy and that we are um, you know, really focused on uh, looking at relatives first and early on, whenever possible, whenever safe. Um, and so I, I would really say that, you know, out of all those things flying around in my mind this morning, <laughs> and given my role in the agency of permanency overseeing adoption, guardianship, and the post-adoption program, post-guardianship programs, um, really looking at how we engage and work with relatives um, from day one has become a passion of mine. So happy to be here, part of this group, and I will pass it over to Donna. 
Hi everyone, I'm Donna Haney. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the assistant manager in the foster care program. And Kim kind of stole mine, I'm not gonna lie, because <laughs> it's fresh on my mind as well. And I had the exact same experience as um, she did. I started in 1996, so she has a couple years on me, but the same idea that we really didn't work with families of children very well. Um, and now, um, not now, over time, we've moved incrementally to understand um, the trauma of uh, breaking up families. And um, just, it's exciting, an exciting time um, where we are really looking at providing su support to families, to parents, to prevent um, placement at all and then really focusing on keeping children with family um, when um, uh, substitute care placement does need to occur and really trying to provide some some support to that relative um, if they you know don't uh, have the everything they need immediately to to have a placement we can we can support them in that so that's my um, excitement of uh, uh, happening right now after 20 six years. Um, Stacy. Uh, thanks, Donna. Hi there. Good morning. Uh, Stacy Loboy, she, her pronouns, foster care and ICPC program manager. Uh, my passion is very similar to Kim and Donna. We are just really talking about engagement with relatives and relatives being first. Um, just much more around that conversation, especially with our new federal standards. And so my passion as the foster care uh, program manager is to continue to really shrink foster care and those experiences um, that children have in coming into care and continuing to decrease um, our program, quite honestly, um, in that way and really focusing more on support for families and keeping families together. And we've already got to do that a little bit through collaboration with Respite, where we're now offering it to um, parents um, at reunification and um, continuing to do what I believe and truly is great work um, to minimize that trauma for families and children. Um, I will hand it over to, let's see, um, I don't know, who, is, is Adam, are you on or? There you are. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, folks. Adam Rodakowski, uh, he and pronouns. I'm the director of foster care at Greater Oregon Behavioral Health. We provide uh, treatment foster care for kids that are in child welfare custody. Um, I also oversee the Oregon Kinship Navigator Program, which is a program to support grandparents and other relatives that are raising kids across the state, whether they are involved with child welfare or not, because for every one kid in relative care in foster care, there's 12 or 13 that are not involved in the system. Um, so trying to help support those families. Um, I am not a commissioner. I am just an interested member of the public. Uh, and so I attend whenever I can to this meeting because I do chair uh, the governor's system of care advisory council, which is a similar council, a lot of shared work, shared values with you all. Um, my passion, yeah, I was raised in a multi-generational household and saw the support that um, we gave to each other um, with my paternal grandparents, as well as my parents and many other family members uh, <laughs> wandering in and out from time to time. And uh, I feel like isolation a lot of times drives uh, poor outcomes when folks don't have that community and support. and. Um, drives folks towards addiction, drives folks, uh, you know, into into other uh, unfortunate situations. So I'm passionate about keeping folks connected and building connections when there are not connections for folks. So that's kind of how I got here. Uh, and thanks for letting me speak. And I'll probably just quietly be off camera listening. Um, Malik. Excuse me, I'm also a little sick uh, today. So um, thank you for having me. I am also a new member um, of the board. Happy to be here. Um, Malik Kihim, I am the manager for outreach and community engagement with New Avenues for Youth, which is a nonprofit that serves houseless 
are at, at risk of houselessness. Um, I feel like I've been working with youth um, who've been impacted by systems for a significantly long period of time. Um, and kind of why I'm here is to help kind of minimize that pipeline from systems to like houselessness. Um, obviously, a lot of the youth that we work with were in the system at some point. Um, and so trying to maximize uh, self-sufficiency um, and positive outcomes is kind of why I'm here. Um, it's glad to be here. It's nice to meet uh, some of you guys. So thank you for having me. Oh, also, uh, uh, Jack, uh, Megan. Yes. So, thank you. Well, oh, you're muted, Judge. I'm Megan Jaco, and even though I've been doing uh, video meetings for five years now, I forgot to to unmute myself. So, uh, I, I started my career in uh, 2000, working on these cases. Uh, and it became a passion of mine and a focus of my practice to to do this juvenile work. Uh, I was hearing Kim and Stacy talk about the way that the agencies has changed over the years was really inspirational. Um, I saw a lot of sort of transferring the the involvement with the system for multiple generations of families with all the time that I worked on these cases. And I, that's something that we that we need to change. We didn't provide services that would keep the next generation of people from having their own kids involved in the system. And that's something that I think if we work better with families uh, and get the real supports in place that are gonna be there when the agency and all the service providers step away, if we did that better, uh, we would end up with less multi-generational involvement with the system. Uh, so that's a passion of mine. Uh, like I said, it's been huge to me to watch people from the agency change the way that they look at dealing with these cases and to acknowledge the, the trauma that actually removing a child has on the family and, and that the length of time that they're out of their home also makes a difference on whether that kid is gonna be successful going forward. Um, so I think that we have a role to play and we can really do a lot to make that part of the, the system better. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Is there anybody else that hasn't gone? I was a little bit late. Who? I think it's just me and it's perfect. And I'll roll us into the next part of the agenda. Or in Ellen, did you go? No, I haven't gone. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Mr. Unless. You want me to go and then you'll close us out? Okay. Uh, Pamela Heisler, she, her. Um, I am the chair currently of the commission. I've been on the commission since right before COVID hit. And I wish I knew how many years that was, but it's all a blur, frankly. <laughs> Um, so it's been a while. Ellen probably has the terms listed and could tell us. Uh, but I come to this work um, in my day job, work with Oregon Child Abuse Solutions. We are the state chapter of Children's Advocacy Centers across the state. So those are the folks who do the forensic interviews and forensic medical assessments um, for children when there's alleged abuse. Um, I am passionate about this work because, like many of you, I grew up in foster care here in Oregon. And aged out when I was 18 and felt really alone and um, hadn't been around other foster youth my whole, you know, except for kids in my home, hadn't, didn't know anyone in foster care. Um, so I ended up after undergrad forming the Oregon Foster Youth Connection, which was a group that did um, advocacy at the state level for policy change. Um, and they did trainings and panels and all sorts of amazing things. Um, and so my real passion was around bringing other youth to the table and lifting up youth voice. Um, you know, they were in, uh, instrumental in passing the bill that created the foster care ombudsman. So it's like coming full circle with Darren. So myself and several youth were on the panel that hired Darren. So just been an honor to watch him in that role and do such an amazing job and kind of create something out of nothing because it was brand new, right? So I think that young people who've experienced the system and anyone who's, you know, been a a uh, parent involved in the system, they're the ones with the key answers of how we can improve. And so uh, lifting up their voices is one of the most important things we can do. So 
that is what keeps me going in this work um, and keeps me passionate about it. And then I have two littles and it just, it kind of amplified the whole thing once I had children and getting to see the childhood they are getting to have and makes me that much more passionate about making sure other kids get to have great childhoods with their parents when at all possible. So I think we had a guest join us, Ashley. You just hopped on, so I'll let Ellen do her intro and then you'll have a minute to catch your breath. But we're just doing name, organization, and um, what what is uh, what brings you to this work? What's your passion for this work? Yeah, okay, and you. thank you, Ashley, also, because we have new members we we um, who don't know many of us, we wanted to make sure they had an idea for what drives us as well, so that's why we're doing that. Uh, Ellen Bell, and um, I'm the coordinator of this commission um, in this role, almost a year now, it's coming up on a year, which would be, which has really flown by. Um, I came from working in nonprofit and predominantly in sexual and domestic violence, but with runaway homeless youth uh, in Sacramento for a number of years and um, girls in juvenile justice, where we did uh, a lot of different, mainly sexually exploited uh, children and youth. And I uh, helped found the sexually exploited children and um, teen network in Sacramento that had a lot of different folks from all over, um, I think still is exist in existence. Um, and wrote a book on uh, sexually exploited uh, children, which is called Singing with the Sirens, and you can find it on Amazon. Um, I never give a good plug for myself, but that is true. So anyway, um, yeah, the uh, I I really feel a strong passion for this. Uh, came um, just just the connections um, of. Some of my lived experiences and being an adopted person was um, was challenging. So that was, you know, some of how I got involved in this and decided to have this career choice. So I'm very happy to be here, and um, I will pass it over to. And I've lost. I don't see. Are you still are, Ashley? Oh, there you are. Okay. I've got people people popping out here, so I. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Wortman. I use she, her pronouns. I work for the Oregon Department of Human Services within the Office of Equity and Multicultural Services as the Child Welfare Service Equity Manager, which is a lot of titles and words. Um, I've been with the agency since 2013, primarily with the Child Welfare Division uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, I am... Uh, I have a lot of passion for the work that I do. Um, so I come from two parents who had pretty uh, hard childhoods. One of them had interactions with the child welfare system, um, not in Oregon, and just kind of seeing the um, generational impact on that and just kind of also um, recognizing that we have a lot of systems that um, have a lot of work to do to really holistically wrap around and support folks um, in a way that meets their unique and holistic needs and that is culturally responsive and that is breaking down the inequities that exist in the systems and the service deliveries and so um, I have a, a huge passion for doing that. I have quite a bit of lived experience in different ways myself um, and then also just recognizing that I have a lot of privileges as well and to use those privileges in a way that continues to break down uh, those barriers and uh, really centering folks, um, community members, tribes, and people with lived experience to really move the work forward um, and get what they need. So thanks for letting me join. Thanks, Ashley. I think that's it, Pamela. We don't have anybody else coming on right now and waiting. Yeah, I think that is everyone. So thank you all for those introductions and sharing. Um, for those of you who are new to the commission, one of the commitments we've kind of always had is to make sure we're um, bringing our whole selves and our humanness to this work and knowing each other beyond just our work titles. And so often we are sharing um, how we are doing in real life and what our backgrounds are. So thank you for being willing to do that. Um, it, I think it helps all of us in this work to remember that we're all just people. Um, so our agenda today, I'm going to move on, I have to pull it back up. 
We've got a few orders of business for our commissioners, which starts with the approval of our January meeting minutes. So we'll give you a second. If you haven't looked those over, please look them over. And then I'd love to hear a motion to approve. I would move to approve. And I thought that they were very well written for whoever took them last, last time. <laughs> I know I'm looking at them right now. I'm like, wow, Jamie did fantastic. Very detail oriented. <laughs> Don't expect it to look like that next time, okay? <laughs> it's almost like AI did it because it's so, I don't know how she caught every single person's comments. It's hard. She did good. I, I second the minutes. All right. The first new second. Um, now I just lost my train of thought. We have a first and a second. Um, all in favor? If you're a commissioner, aye. put your hand up or say aye. See hands. Uh, any any no's? Any? Wow, it's Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone opposed? There we go. I can't think of the word. That's what it is. All right. Any abs, um, abstaining from voting? Have to call that. Alrighty, we have approved the January meeting minutes as listed. Thank you all for bearing with me. Wow, I thought the lack of the sleep from the baby was not having that big of an impact on me, but here we are. I can't remember my words. Um, so just an update too in the notes, you'll see uh, the bylaws are effective as of December. So those of you who are new, those just got updated and we finalized them. They went into effect mid-December. So um, those of you who have been here, maybe take a peek at those and make sure you're up to date on what we've got covered in there. There was just some cleanup, I think, um, that we did closing out the year, right, Ellen? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, one other thing just to note that we discussed was uh, the quorum. Uh, previously, it had always been assumed that the quorum was the majority of members present, but really by public meeting law, the quorum is actually um, 13 as the members were supposed to have. So we really need to always have seven in order to have a quorum. So just for future reference, that'll be. And then hopefully we'll have our full 13 members um, before the end of this year. Oh, and, and that's um, even when we have vacancies, we still have to have seven. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Ellen, for keeping us uh, above bar and following all of our requirements. The next thing is that we have elections coming up uh, in May. That will be our next meeting. So this is the notice of your elections and the whole leadership committee is up for elections. So that is chair, which is myself, uh, vice chair, which is Mamadou and secretary Alicia. So those of you who are new even, or have been here, um, we will be voting uh, to fill those seats. So if you have any interest at all, let myself or Ellen know if you want to talk through what that looks like. Um, I think things have shifted now. Those of you who might not know, we didn't have a staff person for seven years on this commission. Uh, and I think it was about seven. I could be wrong. And just this last June, um, you're right, it is almost a year. Holy smokes. Uh, Ellen was brought on uh, to be our first ever staff person. She's housed within ODHS Child Welfare with Stacy's team and Donna's team. Um, but she uh, is our our coordinator. So very grateful to have her. So that means something different for the leadership team. So historically, we were hustling, you know, doing all the agendas, all the meeting notes, all the the organizing and planning of agendas and planning retreats. Um, but now we have a wonderful staff person. So just to notice that that those positions look different, we get a lot of wonderful support from Ellen. So anyone who's been nervous about taking these roles on, just know that you have a great support person in Ellen um, and you are not alone. So hopefully we'll have some folks. And if you are interested, you would just need to let Ellen or myself know and we will put together kind of a slate of candidates for the position and those elections will happen um, in May at the next meeting. So any questions about any of the roles, what that looks like? Pamela, are you and Mom, Marmadu and Alicia, are you ready to, would you continue to serve? Um, 
I, if anyone is interested, I would be more than happy to relinquish the throne. Um, it has been a, you know, a journey through COVID and kind of not having a staff person for so long. Um, that being said, I would never leave the commission in lurch. So, um, you know, willing to stay on. And I, I think Mamadou can't speak for him necessarily, but his job has become more and more demanding. Um, and so I'm, I don't think that he would be seeking re-election at this point. So vice chair for sure. And then I know Alicia, I think is, she, she can speak for herself. Yes, I can. <laughs> um, I am not looking to um, renew. So I think, I think it's a great, um, I think it's a great position to start out. Like if you don't want to take on chair or vice chair, vice chair is kind of easy too, but um, I mean, you do have to fill in if, the chair is not here. So secretary is like an easy way to to get your feet wet a little bit and get to know like the chair and the vice chair and get some confidence if you're not feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I know it's taught me a lot. So and of course, I I mean, I don't know. I guess we just have to see if anyone volunteers, but I'd be willing to like help someone through it just because I know it could be like intimidating, but it's not. Um, and just like me, my notes weren't as good as Jamie's, but Jamie, like, I mean, everybody takes notes different as long as you get the stuff, the majority of the, the things on there, most important, and you learn as you go too. So it's like, I've learned a lot. And we do have the transcript now, so people can go on and use, utilize the transcript, which is, which does help if you're the secretary. Mm -hmm. And just a thing to mention, secretary is a one-year position, you'll note the bylaws, and um the chair and vice chair are two is a two year position. A little longer. We have in the chat what's the time commitment. Um, so we usually have a uh, one or two planning meetings before each main commission meeting, and those are about an hour each time, and that's to do the agenda uh, and prep anything, any materials, organize speakers, all of that. So we work with Ellen. So it could be you know two hours outside of the main meeting. Uh, and then if you are coming up to the retreat, there's usually a few more meetings squeezed in there because we usually kind of co-facilitate our own retreats. So the chair would help with that, the planning of the retreat, and then facilitating some of the sessions. Um, and then if you have a role in kind of recruitment of members and whatnot, then like I, you know, have had calls with people, um, who are interested in the commission, do a quick call, half hour check-in, give them information, you know, like we did with all of you all when you were coming on. So there's that kind of um, role, I think the chair and the vice chair really play in some of that ongoing membership um, conversation. So it kind of ebbs and flows, but that's kind of the overall time commitment. Right now we are blessed to have so many members and I think we just have two, two spots still, right, Ellen, to fill? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, two. I think we have a, a three. Yeah, so it's, three. It's been a long road to build out um, membership and do that recruitment. So that takes a little bit of time. But yeah, so those are the main things where you would have time come up around the retreat and then any kind of recruitment retention type conversations you're having. Um, and and generally, I sort of pester people, you know, like who are on the uh, the chair and by, oh, do you want to have a meeting? And there can only be two people uh, from the commission in a meeting together, not three, um, so as not to uh, trigger uh, the need for a public meeting notice. But um, we have, like Pamela said, we just go over what needs to happen and you can email me with things you need. And then, but I won't, I don't let people forget that we need to meet. So um, <laughs> I'm hopefully talking about it, but yeah. So thanks, Helen. So any other questions? That was a good question. Yeah, so be thinking about it, look in the bylaws, see what the requirements are, um, and then message myself or Ellen and we'll, if, uh, if we don't hear from folks or even if we do, we might be reaching out to some of you to just ask the question if you might consider um, stepping into a leadership role. So you might hear from one of us in the next month. All right. Okay, let's see. Um, the next item on the agenda is retreat. 
So normally we have our retreat in around May-ish, actually. Um, but this year, let's see. Oh, there's the book. Thanks, Seema, for posting. She shared Ellen's book in the chat, if anyone's interested. I had looked it up, too. <laughs> Very cool. Um, but anyway, we usually have our retreat in the kind of April or May springtime um, this year because we wanted to wait till our new commissioners were added and, and hopefully get those two seats filled maybe before a retreat. Um, we are hoping to push it out, I think, till the fall. So just wondering, uh, for those of you who are commissioners, if there's anything going on in the fall um, on a Monday where it would be a no-go for you to um, attend a retreat. I'll give you a second to check your calendars. And Ellen, I can't remember if we had a couple of dates kind of picked out. I got to grab my notes. I think we were thinking September, October. September. Um, and we have a, um, let's see, so we have our, the next meeting is in May, and then we have a July meeting, um, and then the September meeting, and we might, and we'd probably have the retreat in lieu of a September meeting, and it would have to be noticed as well, and it would be a public, uh, public facing meeting. Which is new for those of you who've been around. The retreats in the past have been closed. Um, so this is a new little change that we'll have to do public notice on the retreat. Which shouldn't October, be a problem. October 7th is a no-go for me. That's a judicial conference. When is, Ellen, the September meeting normally? Um, let's see. I wonder if we could just place it. It looks like it would have been the 16th if it's the third Monday. There I it is. That's right, yeah. Would that work for folks for an in-person? So if any of you who have to travel, you might have to come in the night before. Um, it's September 16th, yeah. What does that look like for folks for an in-person? And I, it would be around the Salem area. I got a thumb from Casey. Thumbs up. So if we replace the September 16th meeting with the retreat? Mine would be questionable. My due date's on the 21st. So you know how that goes. It can oh, yes. come whenever. So <laughs> <laughs> um, possibly, possibly not. So I mean, even if you're that close to the due date, you probably shouldn't be <laughs> going anywhere. I'm a bit wild. So I probably would be rebellious and be there. But, you know, <laughs> we would. There's lots of people here apparently that can handle children. So, you know, just catch it. Oh. <laughs> Jessica, where are you? Where I'm in Hillsboro. Yeah. Okay. Not far. Hillsboro. Okay. Not far. We can uh, test our midwifery skills. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, congrats. This is one of those things you miss out on in the virtual world is we could all be pregnant and no one would ever know it. <laughs> so congrats. All right. All right. Thank you. I know I got to hide my pregnancy from just about everybody. It was lovely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And suddenly there were baby pictures and people were shocked. Yeah, but uh, that's why you're seeing me like eat all the time. You know, you gotta <laughs> keep the nausea away over here. So. Oof, yeah. All right, so maybe not for um, Jessica because she's probably going to be giving birth around that time. But other commissioners, I haven't seen anyone say absolutely not. I got judge. I got nods. Okay, so that's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> Let's plan for Monday, September 16th. We'll change that meeting to our annual retreat. And that will be in person around Salem. We usually work with the governor's office to find space either in the governor's office or like the state library. I think we've had it in the past. Great. One decision made for today. Mark that down, Ellen. We have a retreat to plan. All right. On to the next thing. I think the next pieces are for you, Ellen. Some yeah. Are notes. Sure. These are just uh, some reminders. And I think especially the new folks are aware of this, but I know Casey and I were speaking about this earlier, and that is the online trainings that everybody needs to complete each, each year. So make sure you look in your work day and get those. And if you have any questions, let me know and I'll see what I can do to help. Um, also, um, I'll be 
reaching out to each of you individually so that we can work on getting new attestation forms. I don't have a copy of commissioner's attestation forms and I'm assuming everybody's filled one out um, in the past, but some are not linked on the Workday account. And so what we need to do is make sure that we have everybody's that are updated. I think what happened previously is they went probably to the governor's office and maybe somebody there has them, but maybe somebody who's not there anymore, or I don't have them. Um, and so um, uh, they let me know it might be a good idea just to get new ones, just so that we have those for everyone. And I know some of our new members have already sent them. And some people won't qualify for the um, stipend or the payment for the meeting. So we need to have those on file, but some people do. And in the past, as my understanding, nobody from this commission has been paid anything for attending meetings. And, um, but we just have to get, we just have to be on track and be following uh, the rules here. So we're going to um, get those and get, and once you filed one and it's uploaded, then you'll be, um, someone from Workday will contact you. And I'm imagining it's Sherry. And then you'll have to start filling out a, a I-9. So then you'll fill out an I-9. It will trigger that. Then you'll work with me to verify it. And then it's going to take a little bit of a process to get the payments going. So just to be patient with that. With the other boards and commissions that are housed within ODHS, we have a group of us called the BCX committee. Most, none of them are in child welfare except ours, but the rest are in um, uh, the adult division. And um, uh, many of those have uh, already have good systems for creating payment, but a lot of people have chosen not to. And so it's, you know, you have some people that have it, some people that don't. And a, a lot of times it'll affect um in that division, it affects benefits of people who might be receiving some form of a, of a benefit. So um, I'll just talk with each of you individually. We won't need to talk about it here anymore, but that way I can make sure that we have that uploaded into your profile, that everything on your profile is the way you want it to be. I know Seema and I have worked a little bit to try to get hers the way she wanted it to be because your email is public facing. And uh, so you want to make sure that that email that's listed on Workday, um, that it's the one that you want. You can have your personal on there as well, but we'll just navigate this together until we can get it right and figure out the details. Um, so that's kind of it on the attestation forms. And Do you have those forms for us, Ellen, those of us who are old? Oh, yeah. so you'll send those back out. Okay. Thank and you. I will. And so I'll get those. I didn't want to send them before the meeting, but I'll send them out to everybody. Um, after this meeting, because now we've had a chance to speak about it. But I know that I think I've received them from almost all the new members. So we should be good there. And if I haven't received one from you, then um, uh, I'll reach out to you too. And we don't have, for some reason, Deanne is not here today. I didn't hear anything from him, but we'll make sure. I, I do know I have one from him. So um, that's, that's that on the attestation forms. Then. Um, we, I think I may have attached it, but if not, um, I will also send out the commissioner appointment terms and new, uh, so that you can see when everybody, what everybody's appointment is currently. And this is, um, you know, also, I think it's uh, public. So, um, and everybody can take a look on the website, on our ODHS website, where the, com the commission's, um, web page and make sure that your information is correct and it's the information that you want available to the public and if there's any changes on that you can let me know too uh, just so that we have that and it's available if anybody want, wants to reach out um, so there's that um, and we I mentioned the new public meeting requirements and we'll talk about those more as we go along, but just with some of the new rules on um, on executive uh, sessions and executive 
committees and having to make sure there's no more than two of us in a meeting. And then also um, just the way our minutes are and the need to have the video on the website, things like that. So we're trying to keep trying to do all of these things. Um, the the um, Oregon Government Ethics Commission has now been uh, tasked with enforcing the rules and been kind of given given that power. And um, Judge Jacob probably knows a lot more about that. Uh, but but there's some strictness with um, with the rule following and some fines associated with not following it. So we don't want that. And so we'll be just talk, we'll talk more about that as time goes on. And if anybody has any questions, please let me know, but I will reach out to everybody individually. So we make sure that we set up a time, even if it's 15 minutes, half an hour, make sure everything's correct for you and that um, we get that we're on track with those attestation forms. Well, thank you. That's that covers that little order of business. Um, Ellen, will you tell speak a little bit to the email piece around the ethics too? Because that's very different for us. Yes. So one of the things is we cannot, um, as has happened a little bit in the past, there's been emailing of the group, oh hey, let's vote on this or let's choose uh what we're gonna and that would be considered a meeting and an unnoticed meeting. And so we can't uh, have an unnoticed meeting through email, but we can, um, you know, like, uh, and if, and it could be a serial meeting, if let's say Pamela and I discuss something and we talk about it with Mamadou and then Alicia, and then we loop Casey in, and then it becomes a serial meeting, which is also not allowed. So um, we're gonna avoid that. And that's why my emails to you that talk about the agenda will be with the agenda. And then we'll have the things set for what we will have in a meeting. And if we need to have any other meeting besides the scheduled meeting, then we would have to publicly notice it. So that's important. Um, <clears throat> I think that's all with that. Uh, is there yeah, something else? thank you. I just want to make sure we were all clear on that. No you know, substantive conversations via email. Um, and even a, like a spinoff work group, if we want to spin off and work on a draft letter, let's say, like we uh, have done in the past, um, that would be need to be a notice meeting if there's more than two of us in that <laughs> work group. So it will change the way we work quite a bit, I think, and just making sure we're giving notice to all of those things and and not violating those new requirements. So any questions on those? Ellen will try and keep us honest, but overall the rule is if it's more than two it's a meeting and we have to give notice in it and that is via email as well so we will do our best to adhere to those all right thanks for entertaining that how many Very days notice do we have to give is it seven no there's really it's 24 hours which has really startled me because in California it's 10 days. So I was like thinking, oh, I got 10 days on everything. And we had, uh, you know, the Brown Act and things like that, that we had to follow, but not so here. So it's just the 24 hours, but as long, so if we had a, a meeting that we needed to, we could be, you know, an executive committee or something like that, or a work group, we, we don't have to have more than that, but we do have to notice it. That's Thank great. you. Yeah, great question. So 24 hours notice. So not impossible to pull together a quick meeting, but definitely need to follow those policies and make sure Ellen gets the notice in the appropriate places. So definitely shift for us. So we're running a little early on time, which is magical and new. I don't know what that is. But um, the next item on the agenda is for Darren. Are you willing and able to present or would you like us to push forward? I am willing and able to present. Wonderful. This, this seat is yours. Thank you. Am I able to share a screen or? Yes, you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. And if you have any trouble with it, I have pulled you up your report. So I can do it if you can. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, 
Darren Mancuso, Foster Care Ombudsman. And um, I'm gonna go through this report, but I wanna I wanna make sure I leave ample time because I think you know we could have some conversation, some dialogue as uh, at the end of this report. But this is an annual report. Um, all ombudsmen in the state of Oregon, and, and believe it or not, there's quite a few now. I just saw a student loan ombudsman, uh, a commercial for a student loan ombudsman the other day. So there's more and more coming out um, all the time. But all ombudsmen in the state of Oregon are required to submit a report quarterly to the governor's office and identifying trends and recommendations um, based on our work. So this is a annual report. Uh, we do send our quarterlies, but I, I think it's more robust to send our at annual uh, report and kind of go through that a little bit. So that's what we have in front of us. Um, this report is really a kind of a, a accumulation of information that um, I receive on an annual basis. And the metrics for this report have been kind of a growing um, conversation. So I have a foster care ombudsman advisory group that meets on a quarterly basis. And we've done that for almost 10 years now. And um, really looking, as Pamela said earlier, this this position was um, foundation. There was never a foster care ombudsman position in Oregon before I was hired. And so when I was hired, I, I had the hiring committee, as well as some others, continue on to be an advisory group. And through that, uh, we've worked on a lot of different projects. We've worked on a uh, younger child version of the Bill of Rights. We've worked on um, just different different processes uh, going through recommendations, how writing them, drafting them, what do those look like? But we've also worked a great deal on metrics. And that group has brought forward uh, a lot of specific and individualized interest as well as some group interest of we we think it's important to capture uh, what the foster children are reporting specifically. We think it's important to capture the location that the foster child is residing in. We think it's important to capture um, gender. So there's a lot of things in the reports that have grown over the years um, and, and we try to capture as much data as possible. All that to say, here's the report. So I'm going to go through kind of this real, real carefully. And if you have questions, I can't see everybody's screen now. I can only see a little piece of it. But if you have questions, uh, feel free to holler or Ellen or Pamela can can help me if somebody's raising their hand. Um, this is a comparison too. We always kind of look back a year to see where we're at, 2022 to 2023. The, the number of calls to my phone, uh, to me, is really consistent around 350 a year, and that's been fairly consistent for um, the last several years. Um, how those calls come in, uh, most of them come through the YES line, the Youth Empowerment and Sor Support line, which is listed on the Foster Children Bill of Rights. So you can see 141 came in that way. 75 came in directly to my uh, cell phone line, which is kind of an interesting as I'm thinking about transitioning and um, having a new person on board. I'm thinking they'll have to have my cell phone because so many people have my direct line now. Uh, I have a lot of repeat customers, I would say. Um, foster care info is our, is our email. Governor's Advocacy Office main line. So the Governor's Advocacy Office is the office that I am a part of. And in that office, we have six generalist ombudsmen who handle complaints and concerns regarding any ODHS program. That could be self-sufficiency, uh, adult protective services, um, vocational rehabilitation, and child welfare. So there's several calls that come in, and last year it was 58 that went to the main line that our screener decided should go over to me. We also have an e um, email through there, ODHS info and GAO info, and some of those calls came over to me as well. A few come from the governor's office, a few come from the director's office, 
Some will come by mail, direct mail. Um, often those are incarcerated parents and um, just a variety of other folks as we go through. One thing that the uh, group asks is that we kind of track how long, how long are these cases open? And um, you can see on there 31 to 60 days is probably about the highest area, 107 of the cases are open that long. Um, some are really quick. Some are closed in in a couple of days. Um, there's so many variables, and that's that's um, when you're closing out a case. I mean, one is time, of course, uh, and some is waiting on information, waiting for an assessment by child welfare to finalize, waiting for OTIS, the Office of Training and Investigation Service, to finalize an investigation. There's a lot of different variables that come into how long a case is open. But uh, most of them, I would say 30 to 60 days are is is typical. Page two, this is Can I ask a question about that, Darren. Sorry, I couldn't yeah, get to it. Are these just um like um assessments? So yeah, that's a great question. It's not a it's not a permanency case, right? So it could be a lot of different things. So our office you know, handles complaints and concerns for the entire state of Oregon. So it could be based on um, a child welfare case that is open and it could be um, pre-jurisdiction, post-jurisdiction. It could be a grandmother who's calling and asking questions, information. Um, it could be about an open case that is is uh, being managed and it's re concerns regarding a foster home. It could be about a lot of different things. So I, I think as we get to the next page, uh, you'll see a little bit more about who's calling us and that kind of okay. gives you a little better idea. But okay. great question. Yeah. Thank you. So on to page two, one of the things that that we were asked as well is to, where are these where are these calls coming from? Who, who's reaching out to us? And so, um, as you can see on this page too, most of them are Multnomah County. And, and as one would anticipate, they have the greatest volume of cases, right, in the state of Oregon. Um, so we would receive the greatest volume of calls of concerns regarding Multnomah County cases. Uh, and it kind of trickles down really very similar to the number of kids that are in care uh, in each county, Marion County, Lane County, Deschutes is right there, Jackson, um, and it trickles through. As you get lower in those numbers, um, there's there's some other variables that come into play. For example, if you looked at Benton County, um, where is it? I saw it earlier, 13 calls out of Benton County. One would say, wow, that's quite a few calls regarding a county that doesn't have a large number of foster children in it. And that is true. However, there are a couple um, community partners who reach out quite often out of Benton County who have concerns and are very vocal and have a, I think they have my phone number on speed dial. So sometimes that comes into play as well. Um, sometimes there's, uh, if we go out and do a presentation, I was over in Polk County on Friday uh, doing a presentation for CASAs. Historically, uh, what will happen is I will have calls out of Polk County CASAs for the next couple of days. That is that is not um, unusual. So as we're out and about, um, that that also kind of leads to more calls in those area. I think one of the things that I look at on the map and is, are we hitting all parts of Oregon? And that's what I want to make sure that we're really seeing a representation of folks calling from all over Oregon. If I was not hearing from um, southeastern Oregon, which it kind of looks like, what is that, Lake County, um, not hearing from them. Now, there's not a huge populace uh, in Lake County, but I may want to reach out to them and do a little outreach and make sure that they're aware uh that i exist and the bill of rights exist and they have access to to uh, reaching out to me the setting is the uh next kind of category on page two and that was something that was asked as well where what type of setting is the foster child living in so again anybody can reach out to our office 
Um, we've had calls from bus drivers, we had calls from teachers, hospital staff, social workers, CASA, CRB, judges, anybody can reach out. And one of the things we try to do is capture where is it that that foster child is living at the time. And uh, most are non-relative care, um, but you can see it as it goes down, there's some other, other um, options there as well. Not applicable is a high number, but there's also a number of uh, calls that we receive where it's a former foster child. Um, I've had a call from a, I think she was 82 years old, who was in foster care in Yamhill County. Um, so we try to get as much information as possible, but sometimes it's the, the, the call or concern that they're reaching out about is just really not applicable. We added self-selected environment this past year as child welfare um, really kind of identified and selected that population. We followed suit and added that as a setting as well, the self-selected environment. So received a number of concerns regarding that. And um, that's something that we'll be capturing from here on going forward. Hotels, offices uh, is something as, um, as really the temporary lodging came came to be a significant issue several years ago, uh, we added that uh, to try to capture that information as well. You'll also see on here um, developmental disability foster homes, and they are also under our umbrella of, of the governor's advocacy office, as well as my um, specific section, if the child is in the legal custody of Department of Human Services. Any Questions? Darren, is, is self-selected um, things like when you have an older teenager and they decide to live with their boyfriend's family or when you have you know, somebody that's 18 and they want to go live someplace that the agency can't certify as, as a foster home? Sometimes, yeah, that, that that's probably majority of them uh, judge. Sometimes there's younger kids though, under age 18. Um, 15, 16, 17 that are, are, you know, making some of those same decisions. I'm going to go live with um, my boyfriend. I'm going to run away from my resource home and go stay with a friend. And that friend and their friend's parent can't be certified for whatever reason. But yeah, uh, you, you're spot on. And, you know, I've had 18, 18, 19 year olds as well, but some are younger than that. Great question. Thank you. So moving on, um, we try to capture as much information as possible regarding race, ethnicity, the age, uh, gender. This information is all gleaned from uh, ORCIDS, which is Child Welfare's database. So whatever they have in their system is what we are utilizing. Um, and it's at the time that we're closing the case. So closing the case on our end. Let me just clarify that because sometimes child welfare gets confused saying closing the case, wait, closing it on our end as far as the complaint that is sent to our office. When we are closing it out, we will go through again and make sure that we're capturing and filling in all these metrics. So there are times, um, and you can see um, race, ethnicity under, uh, under the um, unknown, has 34 last year and 28 this year. Those are typically babies, brand new babies that are born and, and um, um, that hasn't been captured and has not been identified. Um, but I think this is a really good representation of, of the population in foster care. When you're looking at American Indian, um, uh, African American, Hispanic, um, we're really hearing complaints and concerns about the, the population uh, in child welfare, in foster care. So uh, if I was not, same kind of thing, if I was not hearing from Latino uh, or regarding Latino foster youth, that would be an issue, right? And that would mean what's going on there? Do we need to have our materials translated? Do we need to do more outreach? But we're, I think we're having a pretty good representation at this time. The gender is again, um, something that we capture from child welfare um, and as they 
uh, change their their language in child welfare, we too will change and make sure we're capturing um, to mimic what they're putting in there. We also capture the age uh, age group. We kind of broke it up into into groups. Um, and you can see the, these numbers are, are quite a bit higher, right, than the number of calls that we received. And that's because there's multiple foster children involved. So you'll see like 466 uh, and ethnicity is 554 when the number of complaints and calls aren't aren't that uh, are not the same as that. Right. So foster children can have multiple ethnicities and it can be regarding multiple foster children. So we could receive a call about um, Bill Johnson's uh, foster home over in Hillsborough and we're going to open up a case regarding every child that's in that home if it's something that um, is impacting all of the children in that home. Okay, so we kind of try to fine tune this as much as possible um, and, and gather as much information as possible. So role of the reporter on page four really talks a little bit about who's reaching out to us. And this is interesting, and I'm sure Pamela has kind of zeroed in on something that uh, I'm zeroed in on as well. And as Pamela mentioned, Oregon Foster Youth Connection was the the group that really got the Bill of Rights um, into to be law, Senate Bill 123, and into Statute 418-200, as well as my position as the foster care ombudsman. And initially, when I was first hired, my biggest caller was foster youth, right? And that number is dwindling and dwindling down, down, down. And if you look at right now, last year, I had 17 current foster children reach out to me. That's a very, very low number. Um, and that's something that we are very mindful of at, in our office and trying to figure out the why behind that and what we can do to try to uh, increase that number because historically it was, I think in 2015, 2016, it was around 120 foster youth were reaching out to us. You'll see that the current foster parent is, is probably one of our biggest callers. And uh, as I showed on the previous page, the, the group, the age group of zero to four is one of our largest um, populations of kids, right, of children. So we are having a lot of resource parents reach out to us regarding the little ones in their home and concerns about, you name it, um, visitation not going well, child's having behavioral issues before visits, after visits, um, lack of communication with, with caseworkers, not returning phone calls, uh, inability to have a CANS assessment done timely, inability to, to get into any type of therapeutic services for little ones. Um, so a lot of calls are really coming in from, from resource parents, which I, I appreciate because they are reaching out and speaking on behalf of the little ones who are probably not gonna pick up a phone and dial and call me and say, or even have the, the uh, awareness that uh, what they're supposed to receive or any issues going on. Um, family members is another one that's really, really growing, and you'll see there 141. We a lot of family members reaching out with questions, concerns regarding um, their child that's in care. So that's something that's really big. I see Alicia has a hand up. Yes, I guess I, I I'm. This is interesting because I'm like learning a lot about what you do. I never knew this existed this whole time I've worked in the field. Um, I'm curious, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this later, but what do you do with the information when someone calls you, like when a resource family calls you and says something, or when a parent calls you, what is your process? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, and I'm a little bit saddened that you haven't heard of this before, but um, I, yeah, that's, Me that's too. you know, Me that's too. COVID. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go back a little bit you know, talking about the 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 number of foster youth that are really reaching out to us has dwindled, and I think COVID just took the wind out of the sail. I really do, and I think that's a, a significant reason why that number's gone down. 
Um, foster youth, Oregon Foster Youth Connection had conferences. There were, um, it, during the summer, there were camps. There were all kinds of different opportunities for foster youth to get together. And I was invited to those opportunities and met with foster youth all over the state uh, to really kind of share what I do, what I'm about, and about their Bill of Rights and how they can reach out to me with any type of complaint or concern. And once COVID hit, those went away, sadly. Um, some were virtual, but it, it just wasn't the same. Some I, I um, didn't even know about and wasn't invited to, change of organizers. Um, last year, it started to pick up a little bit more. And then I think this summer, it's going to really pick up and, and things will hopefully get back on course. So, um, but I think that's one of the reasons. What do we do with this information? Yeah, that's a really good question. Did anyone else lose Darren's audio? Yes, I, I did. It. I thought it was me, but yeah, we did lose you. Yeah, we lost your audio there. All we heard was, what do we do with this information or something like that? And that was it. Mm. Oh, see, there you are. Okay, I think. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so how long was I talking about? 14 minutes without. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not that long. Okay. So, what we do with this information an ombudsman is a confidential, neutral third party that is there to investigate, to problem solve, to educate. Um, anyone who reaches out. So if we have a resource parent reaching out to us, one of the big concerns that we often hear from resource parents is that by reaching out to the uh, our office, um, they're concerned that there'll be retaliation. Will that result in the foster child being removed from their their um, home as a, uh, as a result of calling the ombudsman's office? Will it um, have any impact on their certification? Um, will there be any recourse from calling? So that's something that is in statute as well as policy that retaliation is prohibited. And not only for a resource parent, but for anybody that reaches out to our office. And that's especially important for foster kids that are reaching out, right? We want them to be able to have a voice and share whatever their concern is, whether it's I have to eat lima beans three times a week to um, I'm being physically or sexually abused in my home, right? And we hear all of those. And so we have to be very careful to navigate those issues so there's no retaliation. Um, we capture, we, we really work on each and every call that comes in independently, and it really depends on, on the nature of the situation. Uh, it could be as a situation where uh, foster siblings are not placed in the same home, right? Uh, and under the sibling bill of rights, there, you know, there should be in the same home if at all possible. But if they can't be in the same home for whatever reason, then there needs to be a visitation plan in place that the foster children have built and developed. So that may be something that we would work on with child welfare and say, we need a, can we see a copy of the sibling bill of, Bill of Rights visitation plan. Most of the time we'll have blank stares when we say that because they're not familiar with it. And we'll have to educate child welfare about their own policies. Uh, and then we will ask that we receive a copy of it. And we will um, typically receive a copy. And that's something that, uh, you know, the caseworkers will then get on get on the ball and, and have the kids meet and develop a sibling visitation plan. Um, and we'll receive a copy of that and uh, maintain that in our files. Um, so we would consider that kind of a complaint, a valid complaint, 
and it was resolved at the end of the day because we were able to have a sibling visitation plan that was in place and we'd probably monitor it for maybe a few weeks to make sure that the siblings are actually visiting that it's not just written on paper so that that's really kind of more or less how we would handle a case like that and then it would show up in one of our reports as you'll see here in a minute does that help answer that question a little bit it totally does um and it's also helpful to know that there's actually follow-through and some results that happen i mean i i didn't mention but i do work at uh, the parent mentor program and in clackamas county and with all of our parent they're all parents that are navigating child welfare and so it's like i hear these things in supervisions all the time i was talking about it i never really know where to go with it i mean we go to dhs with it but i feel like it might be nice to have like a third party to guide a, a parent or something like that so i'm super grateful you came today thank, thank you. you and and i'm happy to come in and talk to any group uh anytime anywhere yes i'd love that for you to come to my team okay will do so you can see on here who's reaching out um, and, and it's all over the map. If a complaint or concern goes to the governor's office it's regarding foster care, that is typically sent over to me. Uh, legislators also reach out to, to me as well. Um, incarcerated parents, um, anyone and everyone, as I said, a bus driver, or it doesn't matter to me who, who reaches out. So then it, we the next few pages here really go into kind of the concerns. What are the concerns that are coming forward? And the governor's advocacy office has a pretty robust system. Um, we have our own case management system called Casper. I always say it's it's not a very friendly ghost. Um, and it's really uh, <laughs> it's really uh horseshoes and hand grenades does anybody know that kind of that 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 saying it's kind of like you're putting things in boxes and it kind of fits but maybe kind of doesn't so much but you don't want 200 boxes because if you have so many boxes it doesn't mean anything so as we go through here we have them listed out as concerns and you'll see subcategories of those concerns and these are our boxes right and um you know they're all over the map uh, as far as what comes to the attention of our office. And, I, and, and people say, what's some of the big themes? What are some of the big things, themes that you hear? And I wish I could really zero in and say, well, we hear most about X, Y, or Z. We hear about everything. And whether that's a child not receiving support at school to a parent who believes that the child welfare is overzealous in their CPS assessment on them uh, and the protection protective action plan has gone 12 days instead of 10. We will hear anything and everything. Um, but you can see some of the trends on here, the safety planning um, services, permanency planning are some of the big ones, uh, protective services response. We'll often hear from from parents. One thing I should mention that that in addition to being the foster care ombudsman for the state, our office also has the title of the children's advocate, and this is a statutory position that was given to our office. I think about 18 years ago, that really. Um, gives our office the authority and autonomy to look at all CPS assessments and to take complaints or concerns regarding the front end, that CPS assessment when a, when the agency is first engaging with the family, uh, following up on a uh, concern of abuse or neglect. So we are often involved in that. Um, sometimes there's a crossover between the children's advocate front end role and, and my role as the foster care ombudsman. Sometimes I fulfill the obligation of the children's advocate as well as the foster care ombudsman. So there's a mixture in here of some different things that you'll see on, uh, related to that as well. Um, the other six generalist ombudsmen in our office also handle cases regarding child welfare. I think I was at 350 this year. They're at about, uh, I think, around 900 this year, complaints and concerns regarding child welfare. So typically, we're around 1,200, 1,300 complaints a year regarding child welfare's work. 
Um, so these are the concerns. You'll see everything going through. Communication is a big one, the lack of response. Um, and, and that comes from many different folks, right? Um, parents, resource parents, foster children, community partners, um, but communication. Discrimination. In the governor's advocacy office, we have one staff who is our um, formal complaint and discrimination investigator. We try to think of a cool acronym for him and we end up just saying that's Jason because we really can't come up with some acronym for uh, it's too long of a title. But he has a federal requirement um, to investigate all complaints and concerns regarding discrimination within ODHS. So not just child welfare, ODHS. Um, so it's very unusual that I will handle a discrimination complaint, um, but there are times when it's related to uh, foster care significantly and we'll work on those things together. Okay, continuing on here, uh, page seven again, is going through some of the trends. As you can see, visitation is a big one. Transition is another big one. Um, we'll often hear from, from resource parents or even other parties that this transition back home is too early, too soon. We'll hear about visitations from every single angle, whether that's parents saying, I want more, grandparents saying, I want one, uh, resource parents saying they're happening too often, foster children saying everything, uh, too little, not enough, um, I don't want to go, uh, they're making me go, um, it's interfering with my my um, baseball practice, you know, you name it, we'll hear it. Hey, Darren, uh, Alicia has your yeah. hand up. Uh -huh. Oh, I took it down because I feel like I'm asking too many questions. No, no. such thing. No. I, I was just, I started thinking about, because we had this family that, um, the resource family cut um, the child's hair and they're a Native American family. Is that like a complaint that you get that comes Absolutely. through? Or is, okay, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And we receive a few of those uh, here and there. And that's, you know, when I was talking about horseshoes and hand grenades, that's, that's like a, a, a box that we don't have specifically, right? Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, we, we'll put that in, some type of box here and hope, hopefully, you know, we, it's hard to capture that one really, um, really clearly, but we, we try to capture it, but yes, definitely. The appropriateness of placement, as you can see, is a pretty high one that we'll receive. And oftentimes that is related to um, family members saying that the child shouldn't be a non-relative care, that they should be with a uh, family, kith, kin and we're not being certified or it's not happening quick enough. Um, so that's something that we'll hear frequently. And I'm really you know, happy to hear child welfare is, is, is taking a new look at uh, relative placements. And, and um, I would anticipate that that number could change some as, as that goes forward. Removal from current caretaker, um, you'll see that for last year, we had a few, um, none this year. Access to medical, dental, right? Those are some key ones. And oftentimes that's, I would say oftentimes that's at no fault of anyone, especially um, some of the dental and, and medical. Um, it's an availability issue, right? Of getting into an appointment, um, getting in to see a neurosurgeon, a pediatric uh, specialist, right? Some of those are, are significant. Uh, education. We have a few boxes here for education and support is one information and placement. And um, we only get a handful of, of calls about that a year. And typically, and, I'll, and I had one just last week, and it was a former foster youth who is now 30 years of age, um, wanting to know what type of tuition supports, financial supports are available for them to go back to school. Right. So those are some of the questions that we'll receive. However, we we do hear from foster parents, resource parents from time to time saying um, we're struggling. We're struggling to get an IEP with the school 504. Can you assist? Can you help us advocate? Can you help in, in that way? So those are some areas that I do help. Um, and that's something that 
uh, I've really been trying to vocalize to the communities is that we can try to help in those areas. And um, it's an important aspect. Personal needs, um, and that might be where we would maybe put the the haircut issue, um, but it could also be um, having my belongings, in, uh, or excuse me, having a, um, a shampoo or uh, something specific for my um, hair or skin. So some of those personal needs as well. The last part here is, um, oh, excuse me, we're, we're on still on concerns. I told you we have a lot of buckets that we put these in. So again, on dispositional findings, um, and this is something that I hear bits and pieces of. However, our office hears a great deal of, um, and it's regarding the assessment. So child welfare, when they finalize their assessment, it's supposed to be done within 60 days. Uh, the the person who receives a founded disposition for neglect or abuse is supposed to receive a certified letter saying you have been founded for abuse by um, physically harming Billy Johnson. I don't know why I'm picking on Bill Johnson. He's my insurance agent. Um, so you have been founded for abuse by, by hurting Bill Johnson. Um, and then it lays out how they can ask for a review uh, at the at the local office first, and if it's upheld, then they can ask for a second review at central office. Our office receives a number of calls from families who have not received that that founded disposition letter. Um, they didn't know it existed. They didn't know until they went and applied for a job and had a background check done, and then they find out they they have a founded disposition in in their um, on their record. Um, so that's something that uh, we hear a lot about in our office. Um, and with the number of overdue assessments, that even comes up more and more because those assessments are not done timely. And um, folks are reaching out saying, I don't know what's going on with this assessment that's, that's happening. We'll see uh, areas about release of records. Um, some are advocating for laws to be changed uh ask for the timelines things like that sometimes come up um, cases under guardianship tprs termination of parental rights on the right side you'll see the foster children siblings uh bill of rights and and that's one that uh, is fairly significant we usually you know get a um a call a month about visitation between siblings and um not occurring Foster parents um, also have a Bill of Rights that is is in statute, and we, our office, myself as well, will also work with a foster parent when they're reaching out uh, with complaints and concerns. Um, if there's a situation in our office where a foster parent is reaching out and uh, a foster child is reaching out, I will always have the foster child and somebody else in our office will have the work with the foster parent. So there's no kind of conflict of interest uh, or really looking at that, you know, from uh, equal sides. Uh, grandparents are a, a big caller. Um, 74 last year, 51 this year, and grandparents, uh, I think for those of you probably have, have seen or heard, are really stuck, right? They are really stuck. They're not a legal party to the case, um, and they often really don't know what's going on. Um, grandparents do have rights in Oregon. They have a right to be notified of the, of, of the court hearing, and they have a right to visitation. And grandparents um, really want to be notified and want to be available at court. And, um, and that doesn't always happen for various reasons. And they also want visitation. As you can imagine, a grandparent um, who's had visitation with their grandchild, and many, many of our grandparents have um, raised their grandchildren, uh, all of a sudden are not involved in their child's life at all, their grandchild's life at all. And so we will work with them on those and try to get visitation going, make sure that they're notified of, of court hearings. Um, 
This part of the report, I'm just being mindful of the time, this part of the report is really kind of pulling out what are the foster youth, foster children, what are they reporting to our office? So it's a smaller number, of course, but we do try to capture that information. Uh, education is one that's on there. Um, case management, many of them are not real happy with the the what's going on with their case. Uh, they want um, less supervision, less, uh, less um, instructions, or um, they don't agree with their placement. They don't want to continue being at Looking Glass, for example. Um, they want to have more communication with their caseworkers. Um, some of the sibling sibling bill of rights, uh, those elements are coming from foster children. I want to see my brother. I want to see my sister. Um, I'm not placed with them. I don't understand why. So those are some of the areas foster youth are bringing out. Darren, if you get a call from somebody else, like a relative or, or something, but you end up talking to the child, can you still log their issues in that section? Yes. Yes, I can. Yeah. And that, and that does happen. And, and, um, you know, that's my preference. I don't, I always want to hear from the person as close to the complaint concern as possible, as opposed to second, third hand. So I definitely would want to do that. It's always careful how, um, I don't want to be that strange guy in Salem reaching out to an eight year old by phone and calling. So when, where, how that works is is careful um because i don't want to um upset anything yeah. so it's a careful kind of dance of what that looks like and i and i always tell folks look if you want to have your your grandmother there on a sunday when you're on a visit uh at your grandma's house and you want to call me then i'll make it happen if you want your casa there you want to be in your therapist's office we'll make that happen one of the things, and this came I, early on, and I believe it was from Pamela or somebody else in the Oregon Foster Youth Connection, is they need to have a safe place. Yeah. Our, our youth need to have a safe place to be able to talk to you. And so one thing I will do is often say, you, you let me know when and where to call you, right? I'm going to reach out to you, but you let me know when and where. And if it's, um, you want me to call Tuesday afternoon at 11, and get a hold of your school counselor and have your school counselor pull you into her, her office, her their office, we can have a phone call that way, right? However you want. And I think that's really important. Our kids need to be in a safe space without ears, uh, without a, a foster parent, caseworker, whomever, standing over their shoulder so they can talk freely and openly. The last part here is really our findings. And in Governor's Advocacy Ombuds world, we, we too have to come to findings. While we're a neutral third party, at the end of the day, I always say we, we're tasked with calling balls and strikes, right? And we need to call it how we see it based on our uh, independent lens. And so, um, as you can see, the number of consultations is very high. Uh, 195, and that's really just trying to help folks understand. Here's child welfare's policy. Here's what they are doing, and this is why. Now we are a um, mandatory reporter. Um, we have to follow the confidentiality guidelines as well, just like anyone within ODHS. So we can't give case-specific information to an uncle who calls us, um, but we can help them understand by giving you know, generic information, helping them kind of understand the system at play. Um, the next is not valid. So at the end of the day, we've looked at this investigation, we've completed our investigation, looked at the concern, and we're saying it's really not valid. Uh, and that may be, you know, it could be a, a variety of different things where we have a parent saying, um, I should have my child placed back with me. I've done everything I'm supposed to do uh, and child welfare won't communicate with me. They won't give me an action plan. They won't tell me what I'm supposed to do and I should just have my child back. And we will follow through and see, um, has child, is child welfare communicating with them? Is child welfare providing an action plan to that parent of the services they're supposed to complete? We don't have a say 
about the reunification. Uh, that's really up to Judge Jacot and, and others. And so that legal lane, we stay clear of. That's not our call. But we do have an obligation to see is child welfare following the Oregon administrative rules and their procedures by communicating and providing an action plan for that parent. And so we will look at those lens from that lens and see if the agency is doing those. And oftentimes what we'll see is, yeah, you've, you've been given that information. Uh, you've been provided an action plan um, and child welfare communicated with you three times last week. So that would be a not valid in our world. Um, valid resolved. That would be like I shared earlier about siblings who are not uh, having visits. If we were able to help to see that that is, is, is coming about and there is a visitation plan and they're actually starting to visit, we would say, yeah, that was a valid concern that came to us because it wasn't happening and now it is, so it's resolved. A valid not resolved is probably one that we don't like to have uh, in our systems because Typically what that's saying is that it's a valid concern. We're seeing that these siblings should be having visitation, but yet child welfare is not making that happen. And um, that's a small number, 24, but it's still a, a concerning number. And there are some within that 24 are some valid issues that cannot be resolved as well. Um, so the, I, I typically will give an example of a resource parent doing physical discipline on a child, smacking the child in the face, right? That's a valid issue. Um, CPS may have uh, investigated it and uh, issued a founded disposition, um, but we can't unresolve that issue for the child, right? Now, maybe the resource parent can get some additional uh, supports, some additional training, maybe they're, um, have too many kids in their home. There's some things that could maybe alleviate to reduce that, but the actual act itself can't be undone. Um, we do have our actions. And as I mentioned, our advisory group really asked us to kind of look at that. How many, how many mandatory child abuse reports are you all making? How many child caring agency reports are you making? Uh, we refer folks over to to HR. There are times when our office gets complaints about the professional conduct of staff and we refer that over to HR. We don't investigate child welfare staff, their actions per se. Um, public defender's office, we refer folks over there. Oftentimes that's a uh, pre-jurisdiction, pre-appointment of counsel. We'll refer folks over there for that. Um, and then at the very, very end here, we have recommendations. How many recommendations does our office make? And this is important for me to define because we're not talking about a recommendation of, hey, Marion County Child Welfare, can you put a visitation plan together so these siblings can have visitation? Yes, that's a recommendation that we'd be making. We make those kinds of recommendations all day, every day. Right. The recommendations where you have 14 here are really some global implications of recommendations. Perhaps it's a policy that is um, not written very clearly or a procedure that's not written very clearly, or we're suggesting that there's a substantial change in practice or policy. Um, so those are really huge, high level kind of uh, um, recommendations. I'll give you an example, one that we will often hear uh, um, from parents is that they're not notified when their child in foster care has been um, injured and received significant medical care, broken arm and end up at the emergency room um, receiving a cast and, and all of that. Parents won't find out and they'll call us. They'll show up at a visit a week later and see that their child's in a cast. Um, and we've made recommendations that uh, child welfare notifies a parent within, uh, I, I don't even remember the exact time, within 24 hours of their child, I think is what we've said. We've tried to be very clear that it, the notification should happen with, within like 24 hours. Um, the policy is not very clear. Uh, the policy, I think, says something like within a reason, reasonable amount of time. And we find that policy, the definition of reasonable to be all over the map across the state of Oregon. So we wanted to 
be real definitive. So there's recommendations that we make along those lines that are really more global in nature. The last page is really some definitions um, of, of kind of the, the valid, not valid, and all the different areas that we, we touch. Whew, that's a lot of talking for only one cup of coffee. <laughs> Questions, you, comments, thoughts? That was super good. Thank you so much. I think that is uh, really helps educate folks and also um, helps us to see ways we can connect and work with you, uh, with the, that the commission can work together, uh, not with you personally anymore since you'll be on your way, but but with whoever's in your office and helps us to, um, to um, make sure that we're being effective in our role too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. One question I have, Darren, is those those fourteen recommendations. Those are what I want to know. Where are those at? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Pamela, Pamela, Pamela. So, yeah. <clears throat> when I was first hired ten years ago, the Governor's Advocacy Office did not make recommendations at all. I know, and that was a significant oversight. And I said, I can't be a part of that. Um, we're in a position to make recommendations, low level and high level. And I said, I will be making recommendations. I almost got fired over that. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, we had a, a, a second administrator that came into our office after the first and said, yeah, let's be making recommendations. And um, we developed a process in our office to make recommendations um, that we would do exclusively to the leadership of the of the branch, so uh, of the agency. So child welfare, we would have meetings, quarterly meetings with child welfare and go through recommendations with child welfare. We are now on my third administrator and the third administrator, I think is still getting his feet wet and is somewhere in the in the middle of all that. He definitely wants us to make recommendations. We have made recommendations. They've been put on hiatus for the last, I don't know, four or five months as far as going to child welfare and having a sit down meeting with them. Um, the chief of staff, as well as uh, the director of ODHS, Fairborge Pachtress, receives our, our recommendations. Um, it's been a cloak and dagger kind of a situation, and I, I wish it wasn't. I wish we were very transparent. I wish we publicized our recommendations and had them uh, listed. But unfortunately, we have not been given the, um, I guess, the approval to do that. Mm -hmm. I know there was a public records request done, uh, oh, gosh, maybe eight months ago that sought out our recommendations, and they received them for the last 10 years um or not 10 years but eight years probably and um that was pretty interesting and we were able to formalize and get all those out there but it's a work in progress i would say and under the children's advocate position there's a statutory requirement that the our recommendations are provided uh to the entities as child welfare and that they respond within writing um and it's clearly documented. And that's something that I've been vocalizing for several years, that that needs to happen. And it's it's in statute and it's important. And um, it's one of the critical roles of our office is that our recommendations are are looked at and, um, you know, I guess paid attention to. So a work in progress. <laughs> Darren, will you plant a seed with your predecessor to have the governor subsidize rural dental care? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's 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 a big one. I and really, judges, I was thinking about that. It was down in your area, right? Is is where I hear about that, uh, especially with pediatrics, um, uh, uh, oral surgeons, and and things yeah. of that nature, and children needing to go under for a procedure, and it's just so lacking. But it takes yeah. a year for them <sighs> to get into a dentist. Wow. Sad. Sad. Um, this is a super great discussion. We have on our uh, agenda that we're going to take a break at 1045. It's 1050. I know nobody's gone to the bathroom or maybe you haven't just a gone off camera there. But um, uh, if we want to take a quick break and then come back and ask some more questions of Darren, if you're available to stay for a few more minutes.
Absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks. What do you All think? Right. Back at 11? 11. Yeah. All right. See you at 11. Hello. We're on break till 11, just coming back. Pamela, that's the level of cuteness I need for a Monday morning, for sure. I can't believe how big already. This is Aiden, 10 months old tomorrow. I have an Aiden too, but he's much bigger than you are now. <laughs> you say hi. You say hi. <laughs> Very cute. Smile. Papa just had to pass him off for a minute, so he's going to visit with us. Yeah. Well, welcome back everyone from break. I think we wanted to take a minute um, to wrap up any questions with Darren on the foster care ombudsman report. I have a question. <laughs> can I, where can I find that report at? Can you tell me so I can put it in the notes and so I can look at it again? I think I sent it to Ellen. Oh, you did? Okay. It is in your uh, packet. You should have oh, it. Oh, it is. Okay. Thank you. I will refer to that. And I, I, I may have that uh, sent it out again separate so everybody had it. I think I sent it out on. But if you don't have it in your email, let me know. But it did go out 
So, um, and I, I think there's probably going to be a lot of follow up um, questions that we may have. And, and if we have more than just a few minutes of them, my suggestion would be maybe um, send them to me and I'll compile them and I'll send them on to Darren so that we can get those answered. And um, or or even some thoughts like I think maybe thoughts might have come up on um, the recommendations, because I know that jumped out to me like, OK, well, sure, there's recommendations. How can we help? What you know, what uh, what do people need to know? So, I mean, maybe there's some more things we can um, put in a more detailed question and answer type style. Yeah, definitely. And Darren, remind me of the timeline of when you're transitioning. Yeah, I'm not transitioning out of re my retirement days, July 1. Um, so we're doing interviews. Actually, Ellen's on the interview panel um, this week. And we had uh, quite the outreach uh, of applicants, 192 in total. Oh my God. So it's been quite a quite a job just to kind of get it down to a reasonable number to interview. Um, but we're doing first round interviews this week. And the goal is to hopefully have somebody on by by May 1st and maybe spend a couple months shadowing me and some others. Um, and then, yeah, they'll be on their own July 1. Aiden, did Aiden apply? Because his name's familiar to me. <laughs> Well, oh, wonderful. Good. So you'll be around a little bit longer if we have questions and can follow up and that makes sense. Yeah. So just go ahead and send any questions that you have to me and I'll start putting those together. Thank you, Darren, for that presentation and also just for being just such a great ombudsman the last 10 years. Um, I think you've done an amazing job and really you know, came, came up against some things early on in that position and had to really create it out of nowhere and it's just been amazing to see, and I think we've all been grateful. grateful for your leadership and your calm demeanor, your attention to detail, and your ability to build relationship with youth. I know you built a lot of amazing rela relationships with our young people, and so I know it has meant a lot to them. Just want to make sure and say that out loud in case I forget right before you have to go. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I appreciate it. You know, I was at a, a, a training not too long ago. And it was regarding uh, ombudsman uh, and there's ombudsman all over the world and in africa the um i'm not i'm not going to do it justice but there's there's the term ombudsman is translated into the keeper of the people's tears and um i thought that was really important valuable right and there and there's a lot of tears that are shed by ombudsman all over the world but uh it's important, you know, I think the next person is going to come in with some rejuvenated energy and thoughts and, and ideas and um, can develop their own tears and, and go forward. But uh, it, it's an incredible position and so important to um, foster kids all over the state of Oregon. Thank you. All right, our next item on the agenda is Child Welfare Leadership Update. So I see Lacey is here. Good to see you. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to be here with you all. I'm Lacey Anderson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Deputy Director for the Child Welfare Division. I've got three things to update you all on today. And I think the first one is the most exciting. Uh, Molly Miller has joined me and she is our new Child Welfare Deputy Director, my peer, to say that I'm thrilled to have her is the understatement of the year. I would love to give her just a minute to introduce herself to you all, and then we'll um, go to the two child welfare topics. Hi everyone, um, I'm Molly Miller, go by she, her pronouns, and um, I'm, I'm excited. Today is literally day one of the new role. So I'm um, getting onboarded and getting to know people um, and getting a little bit of understanding about you know, what I'll be doing in the, the coming months. Um, many of you on this call I see and recognize, and um, I've just a quick brief background about myself. I've worked for the agency since literally out of college. I think I was 21 when I started working actually with self-sufficiency programs, um, <clears throat> but I eventually moved into child welfare work. I've been with the agency for child welfare specifically for almost 22 years. 
and um, I've done a variety of roles uh, and I worked in central office for a period of time. I, I've seen some of you all in central office before as well. Um, and uh, and that, now I'm here. So I'm excited and uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing you all in the future. Thanks, Molly. Uh, first thing I think of interest to this group, I wanted to be sure to update you on. Uh, during short session, the House Health and Human Services Committee had a bill Bill number is 4086 that passed. And that bill does two things. Um, it's asking the agency to do two studies and also provides um, the financial investment to hire an outside consultant to come in and facilitate those two study groups. Uh, the two types of studies, the first one is a look at definitions in Oregon statutes. So the team is gonna be examining how we define allegations of child abuse in our statute, look at other states and maybe what's different or the same for Oregon and, may, and where we may want to make some changes to that. It also is going to be looking at who is um, the alleged perpetrator of child abuse in this state and how we respond to them, and then also how we come to disposition. So really taking a look at this front door, as we call it, um, in accessing the child welfare system. I'm excited about this work for a whole variety of reasons, but I'll tell you a couple highlights for me. One is right now, a lot of people in Oregon call the child abuse hotline. And it appears that they call for information. They call um, because they're worried, they call to ask questions. You all have seen some of that data before, but we get close to the equivalent number of LA County calls in Oregon and LA County is like, <laughs> but much, much larger than the state of Oregon. So that says to me, people wanna help families and they don't know where to go. The other thing right now about um, the data for assessment of child abuse in this state is we open and assign a lot of calls. We go out and do assessments in families in this state at a very, very high rate. Of those that are assigned, only a very, very small fraction are founded. And of those that are founded, only a smaller number of children enter foster care. That bottom part is probably good. But my worry is that of all of those calls where we go out and do an assessment, which is quite invasive, and to the best of our skill set, still not trauma informed, we walk away from that family and nothing else happens. And I think that if we reassess how we define what is an allegation of abuse alongside the work of how is community supporting families, we can actually lessen the impact of a child welfare investigation and improve and increase supports that are available in community for families who are struggling or for families that we're worried about where there's not actually a child who's being harmed. So that work is starting. The other part of that is a study to look at how our community is responding to children with what we call problematic sexualized behavior. When we have these conversations about narrowing the front door, if you will, um, qualifying the number of people who are going to be uh, assessed as someone who's perpetrating child abuse, what we've continued to hear back is there's worry that adolescents, um, older young people who have problematic sexualized behavior are going are to get dropped. They're going to fall through the cracks, that they don't come to the attention of um, detention, or there's not enough information for county um, probation or, or county child um, law enforcement, juvenile law enforcement to respond to, and that the, the hope or the belief has been that somehow child welfare is kind of filling that net or catching that net. So the other study is going to be about that. What is available in community right now? What would it take to shore up community response and local juvenile um, departments to meet the needs of those children and families without child welfare needing to come in necessarily and found a child for child abuse. We will always assess parents and their protective capacity and their ability to manage their child's behavior and keep their child and other children safe. But my hope selfishly is that we get out of the business of assessing children and help the community be responding to the kids and families and their needs and what their needs are. So really grateful for the support um, bipartisan of the legislature and getting that piece of legislation through and we'll be really, um, we're going to get those groups together as quickly as possible. Expect to hear back from us about how that work is going and what recommendations those groups are going to be making 
to child welfare executive leadership, to the governor's office, and to the legislature about potential changes that may be coming in those definitions within Oregon statute. And the just, other thing that I, oh, yes, please. Oh, I was just going to say, and just to note that the commission did send a support letter. We did. Oh. So appreciate that. Um, we got support from also some very interesting um, places where people were not in support, but lots of support across the state uh, to just take a look and see kind of how we're defining things and how we're responding to families. The other um, update I wanted to give you all specifically, and again, this is another topic that we talk about a lot, uh, is some of the things that have happened legally in the settlement agreement that's overseeing the utilization of temporary lodging. Uh, the, the, after last year's arbitration, uh, Dr. Bar Marty Beyer came to Oregon, worked with our team and the whole kind of child serving community in this state, including caseworkers, judges, providers. She went and sat in on with young people on a couple of shifts to get a whole perspective about what's happening that's causing children to be in hotels in the state with an appropriate level of care, appropriate placement. And she wrote a lengthy draft report with Judge McShane that really, in summary, says the system of care in Oregon, including education, local county mental health, the statutes, like the whole kit and caboodle, needs to be reworked and revamped. And there's nothing that child welfare specifically can do in addition to eliminate the use of temporary lodging. So Judge McShane took that report, kind of processed it, and has issued what I believe will be his final order in this case. Uh, he has asked that that report be finalized, that we as, an, as a department get, distribute it to a whole host of people, including all elected officials on the legislature. And um, he will extend the settlement agreement through the end of December 2025. What that does is sets us up as a system with a timeline. Because currently what we're doing is utilizing child welfare funding to prevent temporary lodging. We're able to do that in really creative ways that are outside of our normal funding structures because of being under the authority of a federal settlement agreement. When that agreement sunsets, we will no longer be able to do that. So today, 16 kids are in TL, and child welfare is supporting an additional 125 children in different ways to have them not be in temporary lodging. When we no longer have the statutory authority to do that, we're going to be ready, we're going to be needing the system to be ready to respond to the needs of those kids without child welfare general fund dollars. So while a dead end makes me a little nervous, it also really excites me because I think it's going to move us into action around some of the recommendations that um, Dr. Byer made, along with some really needed conversation with our judicial partners, with folks at OHA, with folks at the county mental health levels for access and appropriateness of understanding levels of care and where children belong and where they do well, and also how we empower their family and community to make their needs. So let me pause and see if any of you have questions about really either one of those things. We hey there. Um, I'm. Um, I just want to make sure I understood because that was a lot of information. Um, so you're saying that in 2025, ODHS is no longer going to be doing temporary lodging in hotels, oh, and we're going to be trying be. something different. What? And I said, oh, let that be. So what? What will happen in December 25, Alicia? Is I'll give you an example. Right okay. now, because of the settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. I can pay a resource payment, a parent more than their regular standard payments in order to serve a child differently so that they not so that they not be in a hotel. Okay. We can pay contracted providers to help support children in their home so that they don't have to be in a hotel. We are only able to do those things because of the settlement agreement. Once okay. that's gone within our regular kind of statute and authority, we can do that kind of financial support and interaction to stop having kids be in a hotel. So come January 1 of 26, if nothing is available, that child would just go to a hotel. We can't do the creative kinds of things that we've done to keep them out of hotels. And so that's not a good thing. 
That is a good thing. So we need to have our system ready and right. functioning where the kids don't need a hotel at all because the services and supports are available outside of child welfare paying state funds for those services and supports. Okay. Thank you for that. So I, can I follow up with that? Yeah. So it seems like what, what the issue is, is that our system, the kids that are going to hotels are the really hard kids, the kids that correct. don't, uh, that aren't able to maintain in a foster home or a, even a, a placement that is a, a congregate care setting. So we need to have more of those really high needs facilities available to be able to take care of those kids or they're just gonna end up staying in hotels. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, Judge. It's yes, it's that as well as therapeutic foster care, as well as supports in home for children that are mobile and nimble to and respond to crisis. And, you know, if I may speak frankly, I think I would love your thoughts and others too about how we message this shift to judicial partners in this state, to attorneys represent, representing children who experience foster care, because what we're finding is a misunderstanding of the impact um, for a child to be in a, in a hotel. And we have children ordered into those settings right now. And once they get there, they have to then agree to leave and go to a particular level of care. So, you know, just thinking about communication strategies and dialogue with all of the different partners who are impacting this. Uh, so I think that there's a whole bunch of routes out. One will be expansion of capacity specifically in higher levels of care, but then also, you know, really communication strategies to system partners about at the end of the day, what's best for children, what's the impact if they are in a hotel setting. And that should absolutely always be a last resort and not something that's seen as a good spot for a kid, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks Lacey for that update. Uh, the question I have is, you know, if it is this system wide effort, is there now going to be some sort of group that's pulled together between now and December 2025 to work through those things to begin implementing? Is it going to go through systems of care advisory council? What's that process look like? I'm smiling at my favorite human services advisor to see if there's anything she wants to say about that. <laughs> What a nice, uh, hi Lacey and hi Pamela. Hello everyone, Rachel Currens, Henry, she, her, her. Um, Lacey, you've done such a nice job just identifying some of the key issues and and you've hit, hit it on the head, Pamela. Part of what we need to think about is how do we need to, we, we will be using the Systems of Care Advisory Committee coordination meetings. The work that that group has done is important and they do have a, um, the governor's office has asked the systems of care, like, all right, what's your work plan over the next year? What do you have to get done? What don't we have to get done? How do we start thinking about this strategically? We need to look at that. We need to look at pieces of the different, um, what's in the, the order uh, from Judge McShane and looking at that in terms of of those creative investments that are in Marty Byers' report, which ones do we need to invest and put forward for a 2025 budget ask versus which ones do we need to, um, maybe we're not ready for because we need to have investments first before we can expand for 27. Um, so that's kind of the, the second stage. And then just acknowledging as well, you know, we also have out there um, a, a, another piece, significant piece of litigation with the Wyatt um, that we're uh, going to be navigating over the next few months as well. And so that can have some impacts about what we're going to need to put together. But what I can tell you for sure is that do we recognize that how we invest in where we're going to invest in child welfare in the system needs? Um, yes, we know we will need a level of investments. What exactly that looks like, given just the navigating and the different kind of changing landscape, it, we're going to have to stay close over the next um, many months with our partners in child welfare, with the System of Care Advisory Committee, with the Oregon Health Authorities, Children's Behavioral Health System, with OIA, with um, Department of Education, the, understanding that level of coordination, absolutely. Um, 
we're starting some of this in May while we have a kickoff meeting where we're going to be looking at um, uh, the Oregon Health Authority has a, a facilitator that's going to help start pulling to the different agencies together where we start pulling together what are some of the high level recommendations. Our, our thoughts here are that all of these types of committees and work needs to go up through the to through the principles and you're helping to inform what the priorities are. And then we're using those um, collaborative discussions across the different uh, leaders across the agencies to help put together recommendations for the budget. Um, so that's 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 what's ahead. And then just acknowledging there are some initial investments. I know Lacey mentioned 4086, just acknowledging that um, part of where the governor was really pushing uh, this legislative session that we thought was a victory was we needed basic investments in Department of Human Services for just keeping the lights moving and operational investments. Not fancy, but things like, oh, we have a historical um, underfunding of you know 100 positions that have never been funded to do core work that we need to have funded. It's, those were critical investments that we got secured, yeah, which yeah. was really fantastic because our strategy here has been, this is not something that we can fix overnight. We have to have the long game. We have to be thinking about governor's direction was how do we get DHS fiscally stable and help us start moving in a place where we are starting to identify, let, let's bring us up to where we need to be going into 25 so then we can start thinking about where uh, where do we need to have different investments moving forward um, in future years. That's helpful. Thanks, Rachel. I'm glad that you could make it. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, a follow up to that, Lacey. So that'll look at the investment piece, but some of the the policies right now that are out of the way, so you can keep that hundred and some odd kids out of hotels. Are any of those things that we're looking at instituting in the long term? Are they blocked by federal? What's that look like? Because yeah, um, I think that's a really um, complex question, Pamela, and part of what this group that we'll be pulling together is going to look at because there's opportunity. I I know in the child serving system around capacity. The other investment I would call up in the short session that was supported by the governor was additional money for treatment of foster care. People often ask me about why, why don't we support, I mean, why don't we have more treatment of foster care and that would take care of TL. Those two things are not necessarily that closely correlated, unfortunately. However, treatment of foster care investment now is prevention of TL one year, two years, three years, five years from now, right? So that's another place. Um, so I think as we continue to look at the child welfare practice, because some kids who are in hotels have been in foster care for a really long time. So we have some opportunity to engage and look at parents, family differently, you know, early on in a child's experience. And then, you know, I, I think us too being able to clearly com communicate who are the young people we're supporting right now, what circumstances are they in, and what are the drivers that are pushing them towards being in foster care and in hotels, like it's that kind of analysis we're going to keep working on that's going to get clear on both where we need maybe additional investment, where we need statutory change, policy change, and where there's some practice and understanding that can help impact it as well. So kind of that emergency, midterm, long-term. Thanks, that's helpful. Any other questions? Um, I have a question, one more. Um, Lacey, I heard you introduce Molly. Is, are you, is there gonna be two positions or you're doing something else? No, I'm staying. You're stuck with me. But okay. there always has been. If you recall, yeah. when Rebecca came, it was April. It was actually April and yep. Jana Llewellyn and I. Koba uh -huh. came and stole Jana from us. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was the three of us. And then since April's transition into the director, it's taken us this period of time to fulfill her role. So we'll go okay. back to that same. Sweet. Okay. I anticipate by the next time you all are together, one update we'll be giving you is some visuals about how we're thinking about kind of the division of work between Molly and our peers and who you all will know to go to for workforce development versus practice versus preservation and prevention. So we'll, we'll, we should have some of that more detail for you the next time we see you. Any 
Any other questions for Lacey? Lacey, do you need help from us with um, conveying what the needs are? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we just had a circumstance Friday where against our objection, a young person was ordered into a hotel by a judge. So I would love your thinking specifically about how and whom it would be heard from, from your peers across the state about that. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> Well, I always appreciate y'all's time and, and the space on the agenda to check in and, and you know, your interest in service for kids experiencing foster care. Yeah, thank you, Lacey. Yeah, thank you. Well, good to meet you, Molly. Welcome. And next up on the agenda, we have Rachel with our governor's office update. Hi, thanks, Pamela, and hello, everyone. I know I um, uh, started really giving the update when Lacey was was on as well just to just to help with context so let me just note um from from my joining you Lacey gave some specifics on some of the the bills that were that that just advanced this short session from an overall human services standpoint um we are we're doing pretty well in terms of at least trying to keep the keep the lights on keeping priorities keeping the legislative investments in human services uh it is uh th that that is success in our mind um we have new investments um for summer ebt a new summer program which is for elect uh for for food supports for kids and families during the summer months the legislature invested uh dollars so that we can begin implementing that program we were able to stabilize and continue to do the work that we need to do to support communities for community resiliency and emergency management, um, which with wildfire protect um, with wildfires with COVID with past um, uh, earthquakes. Um, prepared this, I would say, uh, that work is really critical because in the human services landscape, what does DHS do? They have the function of providing um, food, water, and mass care coordination, so shelters. So that's right, like the Department of Human Services is responsible for working with all the local communities to help with those critical human services functions um, and making sure that we had investments there was uh, a critical investment. Uh, we had uh, newcomer support service investments where we have uh, those persons seeking asylum and uh, the model right now is we have community-based organizations that are supporting uh, those persons coming into the country, uh, and that is a community-based model that will continue, and there's some additional investments that the legislature considered there. There was quite a bit of debate, um, and I don't think Lacey got into this, but I do just want to acknowledge there was quite a bit of debate um that was that was really challenging for dhs you probably heard you know both fair Bores, director pakshirasht and uh april flint gurner had were really put on the hot seat quite a bit in terms of contract oversight practices with things like dynamic life and um identifying what should the right approach be for how we should ensure the safety of kids when should we be having uh contract uh rules and regulations and 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 ways that we support practices versus should we be having different licensing requirements and should we license some of our providers as uh with certain requirements um like big uh, big companies do uh, as as a corporation perhaps versus just having a contract agreement with terms and there was a lot, there was debate on that, um, that actually had uh, passed the Senate, um, but then the House did remove that provision. And so there will continue to be a discussion as we go forward about uh, how do we think about contract practices versus licensing and how do we best ensure safety for kids, um, for any of those providers that serve uh, kids in our system. Uh, that will be part of that discussion that Lacey mentioned that will continue with the, the um, thinking about uh, the role of 
uh, the scope of child care, uh, of child welfare in the state. So we also had some significant investments in a nurse family partnership program for home visiting um, over at OHA, which was, a, which was an exciting investment. Um, continuing to do work with the public guardian position. This is on the long-term care side, but helping to ensure that people who are exiting uh, and, and need support with, with finding placements are able to have that support. There's a work group that's advancing to look at how we use the supplemental nutrition assistance program and looking at hot foods. Um, and then really importantly for this group, Rep McLean uh, successfully passed the bill that identifies uh, a pilot program to look at kids who are uh, in the foster care system having the education navigator. And as a reminder, it's uh, the Anthony Circle folks who previously had come to present um, to all of you. This is kind of where that idea came from and just want to acknowledge the, the language is generic because to ensure competitive pro uh, procurements, the Department of Education is going to need to do a procurement process to identify how they want to implement this type of idea in this pilot. But I'm really excited to be able to see how this works at ODE and have the Governor's Foster Care Advisory Committee hear some reports and updates about that model. I think what that did as well is that really also just helped to advance a discussion about um, how we're looking at data and success rates um, uh, for how our kids in the foster care system are doing. I think you definitely then started to see discussions percolate about should we have a specific foster care student success act or do we need a general student, student success act? I would encourage this commission to continue to think about what you would want and then just um, perhaps invite partners from and leaders from the Department of Education to join you and uh, to hear your ideas if you have ideas that you want to continue to offer. Um, there were some, uh, uh, we, we had some innovations that we really tried uh, to advance that didn't pass. Um, we took from the, from the report that Lacey mentioned, the special master, Marty Beyer, there was a report about uh, one of the recommendations was how do we look at what's called capacity-based payments so that way we have bed space available in some of these residential treatment facilities when when uh, an open when, when when there's a need when there's an opening because part right now how the payment model works it's all the payment model just in sense um, doesn't really uh, make it so it's advantageous if you're a provider to be able to operate and to like hold any beds open right so we so you don't have space ever to then be able to, when you have an emergency, to serve kids. And so this was an idea to advance a pilot program for capacity-based payments for the children's behavioral health uh, system. Uh, I think there was a lot of um, interest in this, but you know we brought this up pretty late in the session and short session just goes so quickly. And there was just a bit, it, it, it just has a, had a little bit of confusion towards the end and would just note that um, this happens when you bring up legislative interest. It's not that um, uh, this might come up again next session. It's just, did it make it through this time? No, it didn't. But the good news is that we started those discussions. The System of Care Advisory Committee is really um, fired up and excited to continue working on these types of investments so, how, so that we can continue to look at um, how we improve having capacity in residential treatment for kids so that we can reduce um, the number of kids needing to go into hotels. Um, We we are going to need to come back up. Um, you know, I imagine that looking at uh, child welfare practices is going to continue to come up um, over the next few months. Um, it's it's we have an after action report that is going to be going. Uh, the, we meaning uh, the combined executive branch. So the Department of Human Services is going to be sharing this with the legislature. 
where because of the issues with dynamic life and how, how some of that contracting occurred, we really need to take a critical eye and to say, do we have the agencies focused on the right actions? How, how do we ensure that we have um, accountability? How do we ensure we have some additional checks so that if we are asking for a certain deliverable from a contracted provider that we get that con that we get that outcome? Um, because that's definitely what you saw is there was a, there's questions of like we're putting really expensive contracts out the door because this litigation basically allowed us to increase how we can put money out the door and we're doing it. But are we getting the results that we need? And is that in the best interest of kids? And that's really what this was about and really was focusing on. And we need to take that critical eye and ensure that, of course, we always have to have a um, solutions in crisis, but we need to improve and we need to ensure that we have integrity of our processes and state and federal dollars going out. So you're going to see um, that's, that's an area where the governor's um, We've continued to push on DHS, and you're going to continue to see some uh, requests for greater accountability and transparency to ensure that we that's critical. We're never going to get the investments that we need in our system if we can't show that we are doing um, handling the dollars that the legislature gives us with integrity and and know how those dollars are being used. Uh, so that's what I would continue to anticipate over the coming over the coming year, or I hope it's not a year. I hope that that we get, we get this resolved more more soon than that. But I anticipate that those types of discussions will will continue. Um, I also would just note that uh, there was another bill that was passed that is tangentially related. It was it was Senator Kel Gelser Bluen's culture of yes bill. And this is not specific to kids in foster care, but where where the bill ended up kind of landing was how do we make sure that all kids, whether or not when, especially when you have multiple diagnoses and uh, like maybe you have a mental health diagnosis or you have a DD diagnosis, and sometimes because we have siloed systems, you don't get all the services that you need, right? So part of what we're trying to do was how, how, how do we help to ensure that there are kids that are eligible for certain home and community-based services that like the DHS system readily gives kids access to, but certain kids that are, that are primarily um, becoming eligible for services through the OHA system don't have access to those services. And that's something we need to fix. So this bill seeks to help uh, set out a pathway for the departments to start doing that operational planning work to help fix this uh, access to services so we can help to rectify, uh, or I would say remedy some of those challenges that we have in our siloed system. So it, I, I just spent, right, 15 minutes giving you a, a laundry list of like that is in in a in a really short like under 30 day short session who those are some of the things that we got that we got done it was it was wild it was um it, and that's not even I'm just acknowledging representing the governor governor's priorities that you saw all over the media right the 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 stories were about the housing investments and um and then also obviously there was a lot of discussion about me measure 110 um and changes there so that kind of took a lot of the spotlight and just acknowledging that behind the scenes your human services team and legislators were doing kind of all of these just like base building like trying to help make sure that the system has the resources that we need and we're kind of continuing to bring up ideas. And I think we've really set us up for having a strong discussion going into long sessions. So I'm really excited for where we are with some of the pilots that we were able to at least start discussions on. And uh, just the overall interest that we have from with our legislators uh, on uh, continuing to improve the to improve. So that's where I would just acknowledge kind of where we've been. Uh, and then in terms of where are we going? Well, you heard me speak to that already. We need to then continue to coordinate with our systems. The governor really wants to have the Systems of Care Advisory Committee 
that provider focused group that's looking at where are our systems breaking down for the kids delivery systems? How do we help continuing to have them be in the driver's seat looking at recommendations? So that committee is going to be looking at some recommendations. We have this work group that DHS has that's gonna be looking at the scope of the child abuse um, system. So if, if we can get policy changes that, that potentially kind of help narrow the scope of where we have kids in the child welfare system, that could be tremendous um, to help us with really then getting really good at focusing on the operations and the improvements for the kids that we do serve. That's really what we want to make sure that we are focusing on. And then I do think that um, there will be other types of intersections, as I mentioned, with uh, litigation and just thinking about different types of investments and where do we need those investments. What I want to just acknowledge is that the temporary master, or excuse me, the the special master report, what that report noted is that we've actually made a lot of the investments in Department of Human, Human Services. That's not potentially is what's needed right now. What's needed are ways that we can support our provider community and or other types of ways that we can get the care and accountability for kids um, uh, in other parts of our system. So I think that's a little bit of a harder work, but that's where it needs to be, where we need to shift our focus in the years ahead. So I will open it up for questions. Go ahead, Alicia. Um, I'm just looking at my notes and try to get these notes really good. <laughs> um, can you tell me what public guardian position is? Oh, sure. Um, this is on the, uh, uh, not on the child side of the house, but on the long-term care side of the house within the office of the long-term care ombudsman. Uh, we have a public guardian program. So if there's a person who is not able to um, be, uh, make decisions for themselves because they're incapacitated. Um, uh, this helps to ensure that you have a guardian to help make decisions on their future, uh, either healthcare or long-term care, uh, what, what their choices would be. Okay. And then um, the I have a question about the SOS the System of Care Advisory Committee and the ODHS work group. Are those, I don't know, those advisory committees, what, if, what is the System of Care Advisory Committee made up of? I should know that, but I don't. Is there like, is it a variety of folks? Like, is there people with lived experience on there? Um, does anybody know? Um, yeah, why don't I put together, I'm just going to put right into the link right now. If you Google the, the, they have a nice website that has all the details of the bill that established that system of care, um, who are the representatives on that council, the bylaws, the membership, et cetera. Okay, that would be helpful. I just think, I just always think about when we're trying to figure out how to get these things to work and to put them in place to have people that have either worked in that system or like even a person that's been through the system. Like I was in foster care, I went to a, treatment foster care and this worked and this didn't work or I never got that opportunity and I was like stuck in a hotel or I don't know something I know it sounds really bad but I just think that it can be like one a motivator right hearing testimony from people and just knowing what didn't work because we don't want to do that again right um, and I'm just curious about the ODHS work group as well is that just DHS employees um so probably a question for Lacey or somebody from DHS. Yeah, and I, I get what I would say on that is, um, you know, that bill just passed and the team has to start that work to identify who's going to be on that work group. Okay. So they have not defined that fully and um, just it will be very broad. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer, I know, has come and spoken with you before, and I'm sure she will be the one who can come back and kind of speak to like, here's what they're looking for, for that DHS work group in particular. And then the Systems of Care Advisory Council, I do wanna note like they're, they're 
there are actual, like there's organizations that advocate for youth, but then also there's room on the council for family members, youth, them, uh, youth themselves are also on the on this, and there's a separate youth council that awesome. also then advises um, on the work. Okay, thank you. And Alicia, Adam Rodakowski, who was on here earlier, is I believe their current chair. So we've had some kind of engagement going to their meetings and then him coming to ours for the last couple of years at least and trying to make sure we're you know, sharing information up to them about how this our work overlaps with what they're doing around system change. So we've had some with them. Any other questions for Rachel? It sounds like they did amazing work over that session. I didn't hear about any of those things, but it's great that they happened. Indeed, sometimes it's a, a blessing that you're not in the spotlight. <laughs> you slowly work and get things done behind the scenes, right? <laughs> a really good point. Any final questions? Well, thanks, Rachel, for that amazing update and all that hard work this session. I know that it was such a whirlwind, <laughs> but a lot of amazing things came out of the session that I would have never thought would pass in a short session. So yeah, you're right. Sometimes when there's a couple of big things soaking up all the attention, all the other things can just power through. <laughs> That's so. right. Well, and I just want to say thank you again to all of you. I look forward to continuing to work with you as we as we dig in on um, the 25 budget. Um, we'll be back right in the next few months because we want to make sure we get some targeted uh, discussions with all of you about kind of um, what you're thinking, what are where are you at in terms of your priorities? I want to make sure that I'm listening deeply to that and just understanding where you see the road ahead so that we can understand how we take the feedback that you're giving to the governor into consideration as we advance uh, additional policies and budget priorities in the year ahead. Thank you. And Rachel, when do you need uh, recommendations from us? So, um, we're headed into, uh, we've asked agencies to start putting together just uh, their initial budget frameworks by the end of April, and then going into May and this summer, we will be having discussions. Okay. Part of the challenge that we have, I just want to acknowledge, is that except for, um, we're going to be going into a challenging budget environment. So how we prioritize our budget budgets for agencies um we're gonna have to focus on on um how, how i guess i'd say in this landscape we're focusing on what are the requirements so really thinking about again from this group like if you had specific feedback about um uh Judge McShane's orders and like what priorities of that special master report you think we should be advancing sooner rather than later, that would be extremely tangible, helpful information, and that would be something in the next um, two months that would be ideal to hear. Very good. Thanks. That'll focus us. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rachel, I had a quick question. Um, can you, I probably missed this part, but what is the, um, you said as far as the uh, contracting uh, matter that was addressed, who is accountable for it? Like, is there an oversight team? Um, you know, who is DHS reporting to as far as the future practices? Because obviously this was a, you know, it was a huge oversight. Yeah, so how I would, what I would note with that, and thank you for that question. Um, um, so in my role, I am tasked by the governor to oversee DHS and to hear from the director um, and on practices uh, and ensure that the governor's direction is, is, is being implemented. So in terms of uh, these actions, um, we, we are asking DHS to report back on how they're doing on that after action. 
I, I would also note that, so, so I'm just acknowledging there's, there's governor's oversight, but then what you're also noting is that you have legislative oversight as well, right? So the legislature is essentially say, stating as the Senate uh, human services um, oversight arm, we want to have a series of steps as well of actions that you're taking. So I think it's, um, I, I would say on both of those avenues is where you'll continue to see direction um, to make sure that we understand how are we improving practice. Thank you. And would the commission have access to this? Um, I imagine that any document that we any document that we have that we are publicly pr preparing absolutely is uh, will will be available. Um, I anticipate that a March 31st is the deadline that we have for a report to the legislature and that report will come to the governor's office and to the legislature on um, the after action review that the department has taken on some of the contracting practices. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question, Seema. So sometime after March 31st, there'll be a 31st, there'll be a report too that we could access. Wonderful. Any final thoughts for Rachel before we go to the final piece of our agenda? Um, we probably just want to also mention that we are going to be working on some of those educational recommendations that we'll get to you trying to consolidate. Um, we've been looking at that for a few months, so we'll, we will get that to you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I do continue to sit on the, uh, as, and so does Fairbores, on the uh, OCID uh, data project. Um, we just had a planning meeting last week, and ensuring that this next step of longitudinal data is looking at a foster care focus is, def is, is where they've committed to mm -hmm. continuing to do use some of those reports. I would say to all of you, that resource was established in the state for us to figure out how to put to use and use with policymakers. Please continue, especially like if you have data needs and you have questions you want to have answered, they're, they're, as you, I think you can tell, very willing to work with you and to listen and to help get you the data that you need. They, that has been such a fantastic resource and really thank you for that connection because we've had some trainings with them and they are very receptive. It's a wealth of information and, and to help us identify and I, I think show broader policymakers, legislators, where there's gaps and why we need to, where we need to focus uh, resources and investments. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for making that introduction. It's been amazing working with them, just so responsive. And I think we can see a partnership with them going forward on basically any of our issues. <laughs> Let's dig into this data. So it's been great. All right, if there aren't any final questions, we have our last item on the agenda. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hopefully you get a chance to rest after a busy session. Take a, take a vacation. <laughs> it was really nutty. I don't know if any of you were following a lot was going on, but holy smokes. Um, those short sessions were not meant to be that crazy, but here we are. Um, so the last piece of our, on our agenda were uh, shorter on time than I had hoped getting to this piece. Um, but what I would love to propose is, um, is maybe that we schedule an April meeting that we give notice for to have just a discussion on the policy issues. Um, because many of you have been here and we've had a couple of meetings, maybe three, where we have dug into all kinds of data around outcomes for foster youth. We've had the ILP program come and present. We've had um, the state child welfare. I, what's Catherine's role? She's a policy. I can't think of her title, but the one who works at DHS on uh, educational outcomes for youth. Coordinator. The edu education oh, coordinator. There yes. we go. We've had her come present on all the work that she's been doing. Um, and I, we just need a time to really dig into all that and to, to create cohesive thought to then um, send along to the governor's office about 
what we would like to see prioritized in this next long session around educational outcomes for foster youth. So rather than like, we have 15 minutes, let's cram it in and make a big decision. Now that we know we cannot do any of this via email, <laughs> none more, no more of that. Um, I would like to propose setting up a focus session around some policy recommendation on educational outcomes in April. Um, and also tag on um, reading through the special master's report and the, um, the judge's orders, because it sounds like if we have any recommendations on how they're going to prioritize that, she needs them by the summer, by early summer. So if we could prep for that and have a special additional meeting that's all focused on content and policy, I would love that. So just wondering if anyone else I think would that's to a, do that. I Really good idea. Ellen, do you think that you could put together a packet for us with Judge Martin's orders? And yeah, we'll get that stuff together. And uh, do we want to try to choose a date now while we have a majority of people here? Yeah, okay. do we have, can, do, can we not do it on a Monday? Mondays are really hard for me. We can, yeah, we can do it any okay. day. Any day? Okay. Day you want. I mean, unless everybody's available on that Monday, then I don't know, but. Yeah, so let's see, looking at April. How much time do we need? I think we need at least a couple hours, wouldn't you say? Two to yeah. two hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these meetings, these meetings where we've got so much presented at us are amazing. So much. Never get it's like time so to go to again. Mm -hmm. So if we could do that, that would be great. I, so I can't do the whole last week of April. Um, we have a whole week long work thing, but if we're looking at like the second or third week of April, then that would give us a little time to do the reading and make notes on our own and then come together around the special master's report and the judge's orders. Um, does that sound doable to folks? Pamela, this is Casey. My, my calendar for April, as you might expect, gets filled up quite early with court stuff. Um, I do, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have five different attorneys in my office. So, so given enough time, I, I'm usually able to find coverage, but um, on occasion, I'm not if everybody else is already set in a courtroom. So what I'm looking at, um, I'm not going to set it when you can set it, and I'll do my best to, to make it available. Oh, thanks, Casey. And if there's a, a day in there that you have, a morning, a couple hours in a morning, we could, you know, yeah. put those on the list as high priority. Yeah, mo mostly my mornings are what's busy, but ju you know, the only days where I'm like completely free are April 11th and 12th, which are a Thursday and a Friday. So I don't know if that works, but it works for me. I could do that too. And would afternoon work better? Or are you free in the morning that those days too? Free in the morning. I, I do have a, a 12 to 1 meeting on the 11th, but otherwise I'm completely free on the 11th and 12th. Do you do call hearings on Thursdays? Or you're in a different county, huh? Yeah, no, uh, my Thursday is just my mandatory attorney meeting weekly. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, April 11th is great. Okay. April 11th is great. And judges the afternoon better or the morning? Uh, I can do whatever works for people that day. It doesn't have anything on it. All right, what about uh, Malik, Seema? Mm, I can try. I'll be in the office, so I can hop in and out. Um, it should be fine, but I'm one of those people where my calendar goes from, like, empty to full, like, every, every beginning of every <laughs> yeah. um, So I can't make promises, but as of now, I don't have, like, anything. Mm -hmm. okay. And if for some reason um, I can't, Pamela, I'll send you um, whatever I come up with. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. So maybe the 11th. Did we lose a member too? Did yeah, Jessica. Where'd she go? And Adam. And, uh, well, Adam, he, I mean. Yeah, I was looking at the optional. chat box to see if Jessica, but maybe. I didn't see it. She oh, just popped no. off and I didn't. Maybe she lost internet. We'll circle back I, with her. And then I think there's one more other member who wasn't here as well as Jamie. And uh, so maybe if we can offer the 11th, a morning chunk and an afternoon chunk and see how that works for Jamie and um, Nick. The morning or the afternoon. We'll I don't see. know where Nick is. He said he would be here. Maybe he yeah. forgot. 
And, and where's Mamadou? Oh, Sorry. he's just coming off a family emergency in Senegal and mm, okay. yeah, was not going to be able to make it, unfortunately. Okay. But yeah, that's the other person we need to alert. So would that work, Ellen, to send those two dates to... So I'll say something not about whether morning or afternoon, you can reply to that and um, we'll get the date set and then I'll begin gathering some things to get out to you by the end of the week. For yeah. get that so out. Ellen, okay. would this be, um, sorry, because I'm sort of catching on. <laughs> so I've, I've read through the past mi uh, meeting minutes and stuff, but when you do send in these, would it be possible to you know, point it out, like what the issue is, what we're trying to achieve in any material, that way I can sort of go right yeah. in and focus I on think, it. Um, we can do a little bit of that as long as, yeah, we're, nobody's weighing in on it or we're not commenting back and forth too much on it. I think that, uh, um, uh, and this is kind of new for us doing these recommendations like this. So I think it's great and we can, uh, um, yes, short answer, yes. Thank you. I know it's just some issues are so broad. You leave it to me. I'll probably study all night. So <laughs> a few points are good. We talk one-on-one -on -one about some things. We can answer, I can help answer some questions about process too, if that'll be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being willing to do that. I just, I hate not giving these conversations enough time. Um, and this just wasn't enough time today to, to do what we need to do. So if we can connect on April 11th, I think we can come out of that meeting in a much better place with the recommendations anyway. All right. Well, any, since we're going to do that, that was the last part of the agenda. Um, is there anything else we would like from Ellen in order to have that conversation on the 11th? Well, obviously the judge's orders and the special master's report, as far as the educational piece, is there anything that we have seen that needs to be resent to the full group that you can recall? Like OKID data, I think they had some great data summaries on educational outcomes. Um, go ahead, Kizzy. Are we, are we still maintaining the, the drive for new people? Or since Ellen's on, have we kind of pivoted to something else other than the Google Drive? Well, we still have the Google Drive, yes. And um, we don't have a lot of current things on there. So um, we that's something I think we can probably, uh, Pamela and I use it, have used it with one another, but not really, and nobody else is really using. So um, oh, that's, a, that's a good topic maybe for us to discuss later. Uh, of how we want to use, how we want to use that. I think we have to be really careful though, again, with uh, a public meeting rules around that Google Drive. But we could like a shared drive for mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing I could do is that little um one pager that we did that just kind of summary of the history and things. I was thinking that would be something I share share with everybody as we meet. Um, just so anything to give you background, because that's helpful. It was helpful to me when I started, but I think it's also helpful to put some things into perspective of you know where we've come from and where we're going. If, if we could get the data again on graduation rates for foster kids and the, the, any data we have on how many of them are using the um, college benefits, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's we're having a little difficulty getting, um, but we're, we're going to talk a little further about the. Um, in well, fact, if we can't get it, then that should be a recommendation that there be a way yeah. for us to get it. <laughs> yes, agreed. It have to be one of the recommendations. Um, but um, I can, would if everybody like me to send that OCAD, um website out again so you can go with that? I can include that as well so you can search around. That'd be great. Yeah, I think I, the link to the website, but also they had pulled some data that they were showing us and having that kind of pre-done would be helpful. So maybe an ask out to them again if they need to re-pull it, but that way we don't have to kind of relearn how to filter uh, their site. 
I don't have anything specific to request from Ellen, but I just want to make a comment that um, in the three or four years that I've been involved with this commission, I just want to give a shout out that I'm very pleased with the direction that we've been going. Um, I know that, you know, when I first started, I think my my idea was we were looking at all the federal data and saying, you know, this is how we're judging how we're doing, whether we're closing a case in a year. But, you know, from my perspective, I don't care if a case is open for two years, if it means the kid's never going to come back into care as a child or as an adult with their own kids. And so I just really appreciate the focus that we've had at least the past year on educational out outcomes and outcomes for the kids themselves, because, uh, you know, if we're the only state that's evaluating uh, child foster care outcomes from that lens, Bravo, you know, I think it's a lot better than the way that the feds are evaluating, evaluating it. So just wanted to say thank you to Ellen and to the uh, leadership who's kind of steered us in that direction last year. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Malik. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to offer if this might be like useful or valuable to kind of just on this topic. My colleague is the like program director for like our PDX Connect Avenues to College and like independent living program. Um, and so, um, which was also like, why, why isn't he on this board? But um, I was curious if you would be interested in having him come and kind of talk about where the program, I know it's been, there's a lot of changes that have been going on with it, but since this is something that's an interest and in kind of what you guys have been talking about, he could definitely uh, shed some light on like what we're doing and best practices as well as like things like that. So, oh, I think that's great. Yeah. And Malik, you can uh, let's just connect about that and uh, get something set up. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great resource. And you know, because when New Avenues took over the ILP contract, they're probably one of the larger ILP um, programs in the state now, right? So, it'd be good to hear what you are all doing. Our kids. I'll check in with them. Thank you. Also, Casey, just one thing. You're down in Douglas County, right? Yeah, down, yep. Yeah. Okay, when I was on the CRB, I think I've sat, I think you have come to a couple of those actually. I was like, you look so familiar, but there we go. Okay. My thoughts on the CRB was not, was not good. <laughs> <laughs> off topic for today, off topic. <laughs> All right, anything else from that we need before uh, April 11th to do what we need to do? I think the one thing I would love, Ellen, is some of that NIDID data on youth outcomes, because that shows, you know, if by 19, they then have their GED or their diploma or by 21 or whatever the age groups are. Um, but I know on their site, they do have a, like annual one pager kind of ready to go. So if we if you just pull that off their page and add that to the packet, that would be helpful. And uh, Pamela, I'll probably let's circle back and reconnect because on that OCA data, there's so much and there's so much they provided. We need to hone in on what exactly uh, the key points we want. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, that is all we have. Um, I will see hopefully all of my commissioners on the 11th uh, to really dig into our recommendations and then our regularly scheduled meeting coming in May with elections. So again, please a plug if you're interested, um, throw your hat in the ring. It's just a really good time to be on this commission uh, with some staff support and with new membership. I think we're headed to really great things. So really exciting time to be involved and help steer it if you're interested. Yeah, thanks. And thank you, data, um, Darren, for um, providing that data today. Yes. All right, have a good day. Have a good week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Welcome, new people. Yeah. <laughs>